Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's two o'clock, so let's make a start. Welcome to today's planning meeting of the 26th of June. I would like to welcome members of the public, councillors and officers to this meeting, and I call upon the clerk who will advise how the meeting will be run this afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Please note that we are using hybrid meeting arrangements with registered speakers joining the meeting via Zoom, and we are live streaming this meeting via the Council's YouTube channel to encourage more people to engage in our public meetings. The proceedings of the meeting will also be recorded. Please can I remind everyone to use their microphones when speaking and turn them off when finished. Please can attendees present in person refrain from watching the live stream or joining the Zoom link as this will cause interference for our viewers. In accordance with the Constitution, members of the public who have registered to speak will be permitted to do so when invited by Madam Chairman. I have confirmed those entitled to speak. We are not expecting any fire alarm testing today. In the event of an evacuation, you will hear a recorded message requesting you to evacuate the building. Please leave by the nearest exit. The Riviera Centre staff will assist you. Once outside, please assemble in front of the tennis courts to the seaward side of the building. Please en also ensure that your mobile phones and iPads are turned to silent. Each application will be dealt with in the following order. The planning officer will present the submitted application and will outline the proposed recommendation in full. Any, registered, any speakers registered to speak on the application will be invited to address the committee and this will be taken in the following order. Speakers against, neighbourhood forums, representatives, any councillors who are not members of the committee, followed by speakers in support of the application. All speakers will have a maximum of five minutes each to address the meeting. This will be followed by questions from members and responses from the planning officer. Once questions from the committee have concluded, the chair, Madam Chairman will open the application for debate. At the conclusion of the debate, Madam Chairman will seek a proposer and seconder for the application. The proposal must be in full and include all information, such as conditions or reasons. The chair, Madam Chairman will then confirm with the planning officer if they wish to enter into a period of summing up. <coughs> Members, if at any point you leave the meeting, for any reason during the consideration of an application, you will be unable to vote on that application. I will now hand the chairing of the meeting to Madam Chairman, Councillor Jackie Thomas. Thank you, Clark. Before we commence with the main items on today's agenda, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Rodney Horder, the chair of the Torquay Neighbourhood Plan Forum, to this meeting to provide members with a brief introduction to the forum and its role, which may be especially helpful for new members to this committee. Thank you, Dr. Horder. If you'd like to come and take a seat to address the committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Uh, yes, I'd just like to introduce myself first. I'm actually a retired pharmacist, having spent my career in the scientific part of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I retired from that and have become much more knowledgeable in planning than I ever have been in the past. Uh, I joined the steering group of the Neighbourhood Forum in 2017 and worked closely with Leon Butler and others to prepare the Torquay Neighbourhood Plan. And then when uh, Leon stood down in two, uh, uh, 2020, uh, I, uh, 21, I, I took over as chair. Uh, our neighbourhood plan took a lot of work by a large number of volunteers, but was actually adopted at re or supported at referendum by 87% of the vote and was duly adopted by the council in, in July 2019. And we're currently working on an update where we're partly trying to update the policies where in use we find some of them could need clarification and also to build in uh, new housing numbers where we're, we're trying to work closely with uh, the, the planning operation and future planning to identify potential sites for Torquay. The good news is we have over 1,900 potential sites. Many of these are in our local plan already but haven't been either consented or if consented they haven't been developed and then we have a, a few more to add. Uh, as far as the forum is concerned, 
we represent the community. And this is really in response to the Localism Act. And our mantra is community-led planning. So we have members of uh, the steering group, our representatives of the individual community partnerships. But it's really our side of democracy, and then you folks, the councillors, you've been elected to represent the communities as well. So I hope we can work together to do what we want to do, which is build the right uh, houses, shops, offices, uh, in Torquay in the right place. That's what we're all about. We're not sort of NIMBYs or stopping development. Uh, what I do each week, I receive the same weekly uh, list of planning applications as you folks do. I send these out to the steering group asking if there are any for which we should do a consultee response. We don't do that for all of them because uh, we've developed a policy checklist and I sent an example to you for the application on the table today. Uh, which we do a detailed review against all the policies in the local plan and the neighbourhood plan and put a response together. And this takes about three hours, so it's involved quite a lot of time for our volunteers. Um, th this, the statement, the consultee response, is actually agreed by the steering group before it's sent in to planning. And then when something comes to planning committee, uh, I feel personally it's important that I do present the forum's view to you we may not have done a consultee response because we didn't think it was necessary, but nevertheless, if it's before the committee, we will do, uh, provide a response. And that will either be in support or objection, according to our feelings. So that emphasizes again, we're not NIMBYs, we do support the right development in the right place. So if anyone would like to ask me any questions, I'll be glad to respond. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Horder. Okay, moving, moving on to the main agenda items, can I ask the clerk if there are any apologies or updates to the membership of the committee? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I can confirm that apologies have been received from Councillor Pentley. Thank you. Minutes. To confirm as a correct record the minutes of the meeting of this committee held on the 30th of May 2023. Is there a proposer, please? Thank you, Councillor Cowell. And a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Patrick Joyce. All those in favour, please show by way of raised hands. That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you. Um, declaration of interest. Do any members of the planning committee have any pecuniary or non-pecuniary interests on any of the items on today's agenda? Please raise your hand. No, nobody. And do any officers have any pecuniary or non-pecuniary interests on any of the items on today's agenda? And that's a no. Thank, thank you. Are there any urgent items? Thank you. Sorry, Madam Chairman, um, no, none that I'm aware of. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we'll go on to uh, moving on to items five and six to consider two applications in respect of 48 to 50 the Terrace Torquay, which is P stroke 2022 stroke 0895 stroke MPA and P stroke 2022 stroke 0896 stroke LB. We will discuss both applications together, but when we get to a recommendation, we will deal with each application separately. The clerk has confirmed those who have registered to speak upon entry to the meeting. I will therefore ask Mr. Jim Blackwell to introduce the application. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this application is for the development which proposes a change of use from offices which are currently vacant in numbers 48 and 50 the terrace, both to residential, the provision of 10 residential apartments, three one-bedroom, six two-bedroom, and one three-bedroom, and then number five, Montpellier Road, which is to the rear, uh, would be converted to create one-bedroom apartment and one two-bedroom apartment. So the total number of apartments would be 12. 
the two buildings at the center of the terrace, um, which were internally linked at some point in the 20th century, um, are a former range of residential houses, some now in office, some in residential. The topographies we saw on site today and views are critical here. The, um, you can see from the, um, the terrace, the way it steps down to the harbour side and above again, um, with the landform creates lots of views, particularly from the harbour side, but also across the bay. Uh, there are retirement apartments to the north. There's the former car park and hotel development to the east. There's a no entry sign here from Montpellier Road, which includes cars going round this tight bend. Um, and there are also a mix of residential and commercial offices uses going down the terrace towards the town centre. So again, this is the view now uh, looking at from Montpellier Road which is in the foreground to, this, to the bottom of the image. You can see the curving landform. You can see the topography as it steps down towards the harbour side, which is here, and those views across the harbour. This is the conservation area appraisal. So you can see that 48 to 50 of the terrace is amongst the whole listing for this property. So the whole of the terrace is listed as one. 48 to 50 are here, as we see on that layout plan. And you can see St John's Church, which is grade one listed to the northwest and also the key buildings that are surrounding it in yellow and the listed buildings either side so here i've sort of picked out 48 to 50 in the in the street scene you can see the terrace there that linear curved form white rendered the varying um, dormers and roof extensions to the top you can see to just to the left image the grade one listed church there's that group value that you get from the view from the from the harbour side of those as heritage assets. So here you can see the front of number 48 and the front of number 50. You can see there's basements below these bridge links. You can see this um, number 48 is much more intact in terms of its features and its windows and fenestration. Number 50 is much more altered. Also, this is three bays. Number 50 is five bays and slightly projecting forward as well. And you can see the impact those roof extensions have, which are all important as we move on through the proposals. Here's the range of rear connecting extensions between 48 and 50. You can see that, particularly 50 here, that sort of bundle of rear extensions that have happened that link between five Montpellier Road, which is this building here, mix of pitch roof, flat roof, um, a real sort of, uh, it's fair to say, a jumble of different buildings that connect the two. This is the five Montpellier Road a two-story building. Note this stone wall either side of the building, the sort of size and scale, sort of two-story in comparison with Montpellier Road, that hierarchy between 48 and 50, which is the building here, and this is the five Montpellier Road to the rear, the narrow footway and the entrances and the entrance into 48, which is the right-hand side of that image. Just to note inside, there's a range of original features, although you can still see that, pre that former office use, um, some minor conditions in, in some minor condition issues due to lack of occupation, a bit of water ingress in the site, but otherwise very intact, but vacant, both vacant. Here you can see one of the major features in number 50, which is the uh, elliptical window, which we'll come on to show in a second. So onto the existing plans, this is a, a layout plan showing both. This is the line broadly between 48 and 50. Existing basement and ground floor, note these in that basement plan, the cellars, which are quite an interesting feature of that site. Uh, and that working through to the ground floor, where you can see that jumble of buildings to the rear. And all the office uses as well. You can notice that there's a staircase, which we'll come on to soon, which connects that elliptical window we showed you on that, uh, that image earlier. And the existing first floor plan and the existing second and third floor plans. So you can see all these partitions in place as part of that office use. In the existing elevations, it's the southwest elevation, so you can see 48 and 50 there. The range of windows, the connecting buildings, connecting to five Montpellier Road. The rear elevation, and that sort of cut elevation of uh, Montpellier, five Montpellier Road. Note also the sort of window positions and doors, the existing scale of the the roofs and the dormer windows. Here's just a breakdown of the schedule of accommodation that's proposed as part of this. So 12 units, 
mix of bedrooms, a mixed sort of community, a range of sizes, and a range of amenity space provided with some of those units. On to the proposals now. So this is in the basement. Number of doors and wind doors and different features on that cell, on that access cellar down to those stairs, which are being changed and put back to what was original. There's three units in the basement: two one bed, one two bed, and those would be taking advantage of these courtyards to the rear. Proposed ground floor with two units: one one bed and one two bed, and you start to see that new staircase that's going in there, which supports that um, access through the building of number 50. Due to the level changes, we discussed this on site, this is the first floor plan, but you can see that's the access in through to underneath 5 Montpellier Road, seven parking spaces, a range of bin storage, cycle storage, air source heat pumps, landscaping, and the five space, the four spaces here, three under the building, and the access point to the rear of the building. This is the second floor plan, so you can see two residential units uh, in the Montpellier Road. They're both one bedroom and two two-bed apartments within 48 to 50, with some amenity space to the rear. And this is a two-bedroom apartment on the top floor, adjusted for head height. You've seen the staircase running through as one of the main features. It's a bifold door, originally shown here, which I'll come on to later. Um, and this is a key point which is covered in the amended plans around looking at that, puncturing through that, um, that elevation and that dormer there. So worth bearing that in mind as I show you the images. So just sort of taking a step back, there's some previous designs as part of this um, applicate, pair of applications that have been refined now. So just as a sort of point to note, really, this was the original proposal, which uses a very modern, very linear, um, modern extension with lots of glazing, taking a similar roof line clad in modern materials. And this is what's proposed, so reflecting what's there now, a mansard slate roof, step down to reflect the change between the three bay and the five bay terrace buildings and matching dormer windows with this roof, uh, with this dormer in the middle. Really key to this is the, the symmetry that will be returned. So the doorway that exists here will be returned to its original position centrally, matching the features shown on neighboring buildings. Some photographs submitted as part of the heritage statement showing existing, um, sorry, original photograph from around 1913 to a current view of what's there now. Just note the sort of white clad nature of number 48. Historic England have noted some of these changes in the application uh, and are detailing uh, some of the comments around matching the original doorway and made some, um, asked for some revisions, which this application has responded to, and some additional supporting information as part of the uh, heritage statements. And this is a, uh, just a sort of photo montage just to show how the, the new scheme will assimilate into the background. So you can see that white render, you can see all the windows being repaired and reinstated, the sort of delicately handled dormer on the central one, and the step down with the slated mansard roofs. So just looking at um, the proposed southeast elevation, this is the terrace to the left-hand side, Montpellier to the right. You can see that mansard route, sort of limited space compared to the original um, plans to sort of sit out on that space, set back. All those linking buildings have been removed and retained five Montpellier Road and conversion. Similarly from the other side, you can see that Montpellier Road retained, the link building's gone, modest extensions and reinstatement and repair to the rear of that. Just for context again, so this was the original proposal, demolition of the five Montpellier Road and the building of a, a three-storey um, new build with access underneath. Uh, and you can see that sectionally how that would impact and that space that would be between the host building, the original building and the proposed. This is a much more simplified approach um, to the rear, so we're removing a lot of those existing extensions. And this is the retained Montpellier Road, and you can see how it's modified with gated access, some windows, matching stone, dre stone dressed around, and that scale has been much reduced by retaining that building. 
I mentioned in both reports, particularly in the planning report, about the highways comments. There was a swept path analysis that was submitted. That's been deemed acceptable. And there's two comments that have been provided. One around the traffic speed. So we've seen that largely one way which travelling from the west is a very close urban environment. The Highway Authority has asked for further information about visibility displays. It's clear that there's low speeds in that area, though. There's very clear visibility from that uh, junction. There's not really any footway. Uh, so officers are clear that that's over being, uh, been overcome. And in terms of the site layout, there's 12 that's been suggested by the Highway Authority. However, officers are very clear that seven can only really be accommodated. And those previous comments that, from the Highway Authority that seven were acceptable anyway. And what we're really clear that we discussed on site is balancing the heritage and significance of that site, not making that entirely car parking, that space entirely car parking, impact on the town centre living so close to sustainable transport, and just making a note that it's so close to public car parks anyway, there's a cycle store and there's electric vehicle charging points for over 20% and bike storage. View of the neighbourhood plan policies, the material considerations, and just to reiterate the comments earlier from the clerk that this is for two applications, the planning permission for the change of use and the parallel um, application for listed building consent, uh, which are both approval for, um, by officers, recommended for approval by officers, the conditions outlined in the final consultation response from highways, confirming no objections with the final draft and conditions delegated to the Divisional Director of Planning, Housing and Climate Change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Blackwell. I call Dr Horder, Chair of the Torquay Neighbourhood Plan Forum, to address the meeting in support of the application. You have five minutes and the clerk will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, although the Torquay Neighbourhood Forum did not provide consultee comments, I would like to confirm that the Neighbourhood Forum supports uh, this development. It is a welcome return of commercial property to residential use and we believe this will support the viability of the town centre and contribute towards fulfilling the five-year housing supply. The buildings were originally constructed for residential purposes and the forum is pleased to note that the external architectural features will be generally retained or enhanced. There is a potential concern with respect to the lack of parking facilities within the development but we recognise the constraints of these particular buildings and note that a public car park is available in Montpellier Road. In addition, there is good pedestrian access to the town centre facilities and public transport and cycle storage will be provided. So therefore, we support this application. In the interests of efficiency, these comments apply both to the main application and the listed building consent. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Horder. If you'd like to take your seat, thank you. I now call Nicola Burley of Heritage Vision to address the meeting in support of the application. You have five minutes, and the clerk will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Thank you. By way of introduction, I'm a Chartered Heritage Planning Consultant and have been working to help conserve the historic environment in Devon in both the public and private sector for 30 years. I speak today on behalf of the applicant in support of the proposal as the project's heritage consultant. I've been involved with the proposal from its inception. It represents an excellent balance of conservation of historic fabric, enhancement of the conservation area and provision of 12 delightful new homes in a sustainable town centre location a proposal which is being recommended to you today by your officers for approval. The terrace is truly at the heart of the evolution of Torquay from a small fishing village to a resort of international significance. The terrace is the first grand construction in the town. Started in 1811, it was the first project undertaken by Lord Polk. It represents the beginnings of Polk's extraordinary development of the carriage drives and villas across the hills behind the town something which I find to be one of the fastest, most extensive and elegant building projects ever to be taken, undertaken across the world. Looking out over the harbour, with its three storeys plus basement and attic, its elegant, classically proportioned and detailed rendered elevations, which include a finely detailed first floor balcony, and its smart railings and pavements to the front and long walled gardens to the rear, 
The terrace began to show that Torquay could be more than a fishing village with a few boarding houses. It was the start of the resort boom and the start of the great success of Torquay. The terrace thankfully remains today as a major feature of the town centre and harbour. It is the backdrop to the harbour. But when looked at closely, it can be seen that in places, its nine original houses are suffering from a lack of maintenance, loss of original features and inappropriate alteration and extension. But the significance and provenance of the terrace remains despite these changes, and the whole of it was listed Grade 2 as a single list entry as far back as 1952, a very early listing indeed. The terrace is wholly worthy of its Grade 2 listing and needs to be conserved and appropriately appropriately for the enjoyment of today's and future generations. The proposed development involves two of the original townhouses within the terrace, what are now numbered non number 48 and number 50. Number 50, as described by Jim, is the grand central house of the terrace. It is five bays wide rather than just the three bays of the other houses in the terrace. It was the grandest address to have in Torquay. To celebrate its grand, its grand status, it had a central front door leading to a wide entrance hall that led to a glorious elliptical staircase that was lit by the elegant elliptical roof lantern which you were shown earlier. The grandest staircase in the town. Today, sadly, we are only left with the stairwell where the staircase existed and the roof lantern has been covered by a flat roof. The plaster mouldings, joinery and fireplaces remain, but the staircase has been lost. Number 50 was linked to number 48 at first floor level as the two buildings fell out of residential use and became offices. Number 48 and 50 have been office, in office use probably since the late 19th century. In office use, the central front door of number 50 was lost, with a new door next to number 48 being developed. Windows were altered and enormous extensions were constructed in the rear garden, as you were shown earlier. In 2020, when the accountancy firm that had occupied the two buildings left for an out-of-town convenient business park location, the buildings were put up for sale. They were redundant and in need of a new viable use that could conserve their significance. Thankfully, the buildings have been purchased by a developer that is acutely aware of the responsibilities and needs that come with the purchase of a listed building. The proposal before you represents a viable new future for number 48 and number 50. The proposal conserves historic fabric and the appearance of the building at the heart of the conservation area. It returns the buildings to their original use as dwellings and importantly returns the original plan form to number One 50. One minute remaining. Thank Sorry. you. The central front door is reinstated, a central elliptical staircase is returned to the heart of the building, the modern staircase is removed, the elliptical roof lantern is restored and the windows of number 50 are put back to their original form. The rear extension of number 50 is removed which allows the rear of the original building to be appreciated and the 1930s building at the rear of the plot is retained and sustainably converted. In total, 12 good-sized one- or two-bedroom dwellings are provided without any loss of significant historic fabric. This number of dwellings is required to balance out the cost of conservation. There are no material concerns raised by officers with regard to the proposal, which has been the subject of careful negotiation and adaptation over the last two years. The proposal is found to offer a good opportunity cons to conserve number 48 and number 50 and to establish a long-term viable use for this part of the terrace. The proposal conserves the historic core of the resort of Torquay. It's a good project for the terrace and a good project for Torquay. Your officers uh, thank agree. Thank you, Miss Burley, who have but run out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Your officers agree it should be approved. Thank you for your time. If you'd like to take your seat. Thank, thank you. you. Committee members, I will now invite questions to the planning officer. Please may I remind members questions should only cover matters not raised in the presentation. Are there any members wishing to ask a question? Thank you. No questions for the officer? Okay, in that case, um, I will open the application for debate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, I, I actually welcome this um, uh, application. Uh, I think it is a very sympathetic um, design. It recognises the heritage of what is a fantastic asset, i.e. the terrace, um, and the 
additional uh, roof development actually is sympath sympathetic and probably more sympathetic than some of the other neighbouring developments that have been uh, permitted in the past. And, of course, the uh, eradicating those awful uh, nondescript extensions that have been formed over previous years is only adding to the uh, quality of the uh, application in front of us. And, of course, it does pre uh, provide those 12 additional um, units of accommodation, which uh, Torbay is desperate in need of. Um, and whilst there may have been some concerns about car parking, I think because of its location and uh, proximity to the town centre, um, it, it doesn't create any concern for me. So I'd be happy to support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Um, I now call Adam, Councillor Adam Billings. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'd um, endorse the comments that we've heard earlier, um, both from uh, Dr. Horder and uh, also Councillor Cowell. Um, I, I personally, I was a little bit disappointed to see only seven car parking spaces. Uh, I think there was there would have been uh, benefit if we'd been able to find 12 on the site uh, in line with the, um, the, the Highways Authority's um, uh, initial suggested guidance but equally understand that this is a listed building, uh, that, there's, that there's space constraints and uh, that, that flow with the site, and there's only so much that can be done to work with the existing fabric. Um, we were able to see earlier the, the very clear um, uh, rot and decay that there was to the fabric of the building to the front. Some of the windows in particular looked like they'd got quite severe either wet or dry rot. Uh, and what we've got here is a proposal that will will provide a way of um, uh, of, of uplifting the fabric of the building to, to how we'd like to see uh, a historic building like this um, retained in Torbay. Um, and I, I, I I was persuaded that the that the, the roof line was um, was was going to be much more um, sympathetic and attractive than than that sort of on the buildings either side. Particularly, um, it's not so clear from the, the from the flat sort of 2D drawings, but. We're, we're losing the projecting um, soffit and fascia on the very top story. So when you're viewing from roof, from, from ground level, the roof will appear to recede back further. And, and that was something that I, I think will, will allow us to, um, from ground level, focus on the, the main sort of stories of the building rather than the roof additions. So I'd, I'd agree. I sort of, I think this is a welcome proposal. It's been sensibly thought out and, and it seems to be very, very in keeping with the building. And um, uh, sort of, I'd be, be interested to see what other councillors thought, but I'd be quite happy to, to move approval at a later date, uh, unless there's further debate we've got, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Councillor Mike Fox, thank you. Just to add my comments of uh, agreement um, on the quality of the scheme, I'm possibly a bit more bullish on the car parking than Councillor Billings. I think that in the sustainable location it's in and the proximity of uh, a large car park short walk away, um, that seven is, 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 is very appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Thank you, Councillor Toshard. Um, yes, I'd like to echo the uh, comments on the quality of the proposals, I think. Um, when we had a site visit this morning, it was evident, um, you know, the, the great deal of thought that's come into almost rebalancing those um, two properties. Um, we have expressed concern, I suppose, about um, the uh, parking provision, but I understand that, you know, for sustainability and where, and where the development is actually situated, um, the seven parking spaces are adequate. Um, how, are, how are they going to be allocated? I mean, is that down to, um, you know, when the properties come up for sort of purchase, as it were, or um, is it going to be open to people to, to sort of buy a parking, a parking space? Thank you. Yeah, we discussed it on site. The, the, um, there's no allocation of those parking. That's a sort of operational thing. The quantum of parking is seven. 
So it's around how those those apartments are managed. Uh, and Councillor Williams was right with that. That um, those comments around how that's as you can see the picture the the slenderness of the site, the need to provide bin stores, cycle parking, the air source heat pumps, um, and the the significance of the building itself and freeing up of that space. All those factors come into play when you link in then sustainable transport. Seven is is actually quite a lot, I would suggest. So actually, that's a quite a high level parking considering it's such an urban urban location and given the confines of the site. So to answer your question, it's an operational thing, I would say. Thank you, Councillor Toshard. Um, do you have any other, any other debate on this matter? It's not you, me. Okay, she's, uh, she's deep in thought there. <laughs> okay, um, any more debate from any other members? Thank you, Councillor Joyce. I would thank you, Chair. I'd just like to agree with everybody else. It's very sympathetically done. It's protecting the heritage of the area on the terrace. Like Councillor Fox, I don't particularly have any concerns re the parking either. I think with its location, with the infrastructure of transport in that particular area, I just think it's going to add value and protect the environment around the terrace. Thank you, Councillor Joyce. Is there any more debate from members? No? Okay, thank you. Do I have a proposal then, please? Ha happy to propose as recommended by the officers. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. And do I have a seconder? Thank you. Yes, Councilor. Chair, you do have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Villings. Are there any debate on the proposals in the second? Thank you. Okay, um, I call upon um, any summing up from Mr Blackwell, please. Nothing to add for me, thank you. Thank you very much. So I will now go to the vote. Um, all those in support of the application, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. Thank you. I now declare this application approved. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item seven. Okay, sorry, I have moved on a little too quick. <laughs> um, do we have a proposal for the application, which is the second part, uh, P stroke 2022, stroke 0896, stroke LB? Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Ha happy to propose as published. Thank you very much. And do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Billings. So, um, okay, so I will go straight to the vote on that. Um, all those in favour? Thank you, that's unanimous. I declare this application as approved. Thank you. So now we are moving on to <laughs> item seven, <laughs> to consider an application for 21 Sands Road, Paynton. The clerk has confirmed those who have registered to speak upon entry to the meeting. I will therefore ask Mr. Alexis Moran to introduce the application. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the site is 21 Sands Road, Paynton. Its last use was a B&B stroke hotel known as Three Palms. The proposal is for a change of use to 10 self-contained residential units for supported living with communal facilities. It's outside of the local plan core tourism investment area, but within the Paynton neighborhood plan core tourism investment area. 
It's located within an area of mixed residential and commercial properties and within flood zone three. The application is supported by a site-specific flood risk assessment, which has been reviewed by the council's drain engineer and the environment agency. The consultation responses from both state that providing the identified flood mitigation measures are incorporated, the proposal is acceptable. Uh, this image shows the front of the site. Uh, as we saw on site earlier on, all signage is to be removed as part of the proposal. And at the rear, there is a new fire escape staircase to be added, which isn't highly visible in the wider street scene, just in here. The proposed change of use to 10 self-contained residential units for supported living is much like the proposal that went before the May Planning Committee with the accommodation offering support services to vulnerable persons with low to medium mental health needs who've been referred by Torbay and South Devon NHS Trust and the Council's social care team. It will be managed by Westford Housing Group and residents are expected to stay for an average of 18 to 24 months. Staff will be on site between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m with on-call support available outside these hours. Each unit will have its own kitchen and bathroom, and there'll be shared kitchen and dining space for group activities. A letter was submitted in support of the application from the council's care commissioning team, stating that Torbay Council is working to reduce the number of people with enduring mental ill health living in residential care, when they have the ability to live in a recovery-orientated housing-based model of support, and that the model of high-quality self-contained accommodation proposed will offer individuals with identified support needs greater choice and control. Approximately 39 objections have been received, the majority relating to the impact on the, on the tourism offer in the area. This map shows the local plan core tourism investment area in green there, so we can see that the site is outside of that. However, the site is just within the Painter Neighbourhood Plan core tourism investment area, and as such, uh, Painter Neighbourhood Plan Policy PNP14 is relevant. The site is a modest sized facility which was run by the owners. The loss of the tourism function of the, the loss to the tourism function of the area and the local tourism economy is considered to be negligible. Given the amount of tourism accommodation near to the site, particularly within the local planned core tourism investment area, which includes the extra 280 bed hotels at the Park Hotel and uh, the former Lighthouse, it's concluded that the site is of limited significance to the the overall tourism offer in the vicinity. And paragraph 11 of the MPPF states, sets out the presumption in, fa in favour of sustainable development. For decision making, this means where the development plan policies are out of date, permission should be granted unless the impacts of doing so would demonstrably and significantly outweigh the benefits when assessed against the MPPF taken as a whole. The council cannot demonstrate a five year housing land supply or the required three year housing delivery. The site is within the built up area in a sustainable location and the provision of 10 supported affordable units is a substantial benefit. The proposal has been tested against the criteria of policy PMP14 and is considered to largely comply with it. And due to the lack of a three and five year housing land mm -hmm. supply, the tilted balance through the provision of 10 affordable units weighs significantly in favor of the development. In conclusion, the proposal is in accordance with the provisions of the development plan when taken as a whole and the tilted balance had significant weight in favour of the development in the absence of harm being identified. The proposal is considered to be acceptable in principle and would result in clear social benefits by providing a specialist form of supported accommodation to primarily serve the residents of Torbay, which would not unduly impact on local immunity. It's considered to be acceptable in terms of ecology, flood risk matters, and is considered to represent sustainable developments. The officer recommendation is therefore one of conditional approval subject to the conditions outlined on pages 77 to 80 of the agenda, with final drafting of conditions delegated to the Divisional Director of Planning, Housing, Climate Emergency, and the resolution of any new material considerations that may come to light following planning committee to be delegated to the Divisional Director of Planning, Housing and Climate Emergency, including the addition of any necessary further planning conditions or obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Moran. I now call Mr. Adam Stewart to address the meeting against the application. Mr. Stewart, you have five minutes in total and the clerk will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. My business is in Stafford Road, directly behind the Three Palms Hotel, and I'm also representing hotels and guest accommodation providers within the close proximity of this proposal. We fully recognise the need for this type of facility in the Bay and the important work of Westford Homes in providing accommodation and a service for vulnerable adults. 
We understand wherever this facility was proposed, you would likely receive numerous objections. However, in this instance, our objection is solely based on its location within a red tourist zone. Three Palms Hotel is in the core tourist investment area of the Painton Neighbourhood Plan. All holiday accommodation within this area should remain protected for hotel tourism and leisure use. The approval of 10 supported living flats within this area would set a dangerous precedent to any future applications within this zone. The tourism industry is a vital to the economy of Paynton and these planning policies need to be upheld. The applicant's design and access statement quote planning policies TO2 and PNP14 and a management plan that highlights the need to reduce stock. Policy PNP14 indicates that it will allow change where it can be evidenced that there's no reasonable prospect for t continuing use for tourism purposes. Three Palms is a 15 bedroom hotel advertised as 300 metres from the beach. It was operating as such until the end of last season. It is currently rated 9.1 or superb on booking.com from 410 reviews. It is also accredited four stars by Visit England. There clearly isn't any evidence that there is no reasonable prospect of continued use. The requirement of policy TO2 have clearly not been met. Three Palms provides the full range of facilities you would expect of a hotel of its size. It is clearly not in an area in need of regeneration and isn't in the category of redundant stock or of limited significance. TO2 seeks to restore buildings to their original historic form by the removal of unsightly features. This proposal has no provision to remove the unsightly features, such as front and rear flat roof extensions. Indeed, the proposed fire escape would only add to these. References to the turning of the tide for Torbay tourism strategy, recommending that an oversupply of small and outmoded accommodation be reduced, has been misquoted. It actually refers to accommodation in the four to 10 bedroom category. The additional beds recently offered by the new Mercure Hotel development are clearly aimed at a different clientele, with rooms at three times the price of hotels like Three Palms. They offer affordable family accommodation and the many reviews would seem to support that view. Westwood Homes should have been made aware of the, by their advisors of the clear planning policy in this location. Several other hotels and holiday lets are available outside of the tourism investment zone. An earlier application for the same proposal was refused on the 15th of December. The planning officer gave three key reasons for the refusal. Firstly, that the pro proposed development results in the loss of a tourism facility contrary to policies TO2 of the lo Torbay Local Plan and policy PNP14 of the Paint and Neighbourhood Plan. Secondly, the proposed development would provide a poor quality residential environment contrary to policies H1 and DE3 of the Local Plan. The third refusal, that the proposed use would result in the loss of an existing hotel and change to a building containing 10 flats, all of which would be below the space standard set out in policy DE3 of the local plan and is contrary to policy SS11 of the local plan. So these were the planning officer's comments just six months ago, clearly greater than the technical remaining. issues as the applicant had suggested. The second application for the same proposal has not in any way addressed any of these three key reasons for the planning officer's refusal. We are therefore perplexed that this latest application has now been recommended for approval. We would like to know why the sudden change and disregard for the several planning policies quoted in the officer's initial refusal. We can understand on the face of this why you wouldn't want to vote against a mental health facility, but the need for this facility shouldn't override planning policy set out to protect our tourist industry. Neighbouring hotels have made significant personal investment on the understanding that the development plans are there to help protect businesses of Torbay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Stewart. If you'd like to take your seat, thank you. I now call on Di Sterling Chow and Rosie Dinnan of Westwood Housing, who are joining us via Zoom to address the meeting in support of the application. You have five minutes in total, and the clerk will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Councillors. I'm Rosie Dinnan from Tetlow King Planning. 
speaking on behalf of Westwood and will be followed by Di, Di Serling Chow, Westwood's Associate Ex Executive Director of Support Services. Thank you for allowing us a few minutes to speak. Westwood welcomes the report's recommendation and appreciate the time officers have spent with us on this revised application. As the officer's report outlines, the use of the site as a supporting housing scheme for residents is acceptable in planning terms. The revised application addresses matters such as flood risk and provides further details on how the premises would be managed and operated by Westwood. Whilst we welcome the officer's recommendation for approval, we do have concerns about condition two as drafted, as unfortunately we did not have cited the planning conditions before the committee report was published. The planning officer has subsequently indicated that they are willing to discuss the conditions, but the conditions further and subject to committee's decision this afternoon. However, we would like our concerns formally noted. Condition two as drafted is unnecessarily restrictive and onerous for Westwood. As drafted, the condition seeks to limit the occupants to Torbay residents only. However, as the application submission material clearly states, priority will be given to referrals from Torbay and South Devon NHS Foundation Trust and Torbay Adult Mental Health Service Care Team. However, if vacancies are not filled, they will be opened up to other providers, including Devon Partnership NHS Trust. Indeed, this is part of the agreed framework arrangements with the commissioning bodies. Furthermore, condition two reads as though it's a personal condition as it can only be used by Westwood and its use will cease once Westwood sell the property. There is no reason why the permission needs to be personal to Westwood as we have demonstrated that the use is acceptable in this location and this has been endorsed by the planning officer's recommendation. Therefore, another organisation using it for C2 use purposes should be equally acceptable as our own proposals. Westwoods are concerned that such a restrictive condition would leave the property with a nil use value if in future they sell the property. National planning advice contained in the planning practice guidance advises against the use of personal conditions except in exceptional circumstances, which this is not. A condition as drafted would not meet these six tests. We would accept a condition that would limit the occupancy to 10 residents as the service provision allows only for single occupancy of each flat. Due to the continued need for such services, Westwood have been actively trying to identify an appropriate property for some time. Key objectives of finding a property is that it's the right size and in the right location. The property at Three Palms meets these essential criteria. The Three Palms guest house ceased trading as a bed and breakfast last year and it's ideally suited for Westwood's purposes by providing a supported housing service being close to services and amenities. The proposal comprises the conversion of the buildings into 10 self-contained single occupancy flats and provides group workspaces, a communal kitchen and laundry facilities, staff offices and private one-to-one -one meeting rooms. To engage further with the community, Westwood hosted a drop-in consultation event at Paint and Rugby Club in March 2023 provide further information about the proposals and Westwood's supporting housing services. The event was well attended by local residents, stakeholders and councillors. Westwood appreciates that some local residents have raised concerns about the proposal, but Westwood is a long-standing, long responsible and regulated social landlord and is very experienced in providing supported housing that benefits the well-being of residents. We own and manage a portfolio of properties in Torbay and across the southwest. The new supported housing service at One Three Palms remaining. will operate similarly to the existing housing facility at Steepway in Torbay, which has been very successful in assisting local residents to live independently, build confidence and increase skills. It's a much needed and invaluable service which will benefit Torbay residents. Westwood Housing are on the Torbay Supported Living Framework to develop and manage such specialist services and the Steep Waste Service is a shining example of good practice which we hope to replicate at Three Palms. As with our Steep Waste site, residents will be referred to the service and priority given to referrals from Torbay and South Devon NHS Foundation Trust Specialist Mental Health Team and Torbay Adult Mental Health Social Care Team. All residents will have assured shorthold tenancies, likely to become assured tenancies under the Renters Reform Bill, 
and will receive personalised support in how to manage their tenancies to develop confidence. Thank you, Miss Sterling Chow and, and Miss Dynan. Your five minutes are up. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, I will now invite questions to the planning officer. Please may I remind members questions should only cover matters not raised in the presentation. Are there any members wishing to ask a question from the officer? Thank you, Councillor Billings. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've got a number of questions. Um, first one would relate to some of the things we've been told. Um, I believe I heard in the presentation from Westwood Housing uh, that the planning uh, agent was uh, advocating for the removal of uh, condition two and uh, indicated that there wasn't a sound basis for it, um, uh, which would suggest that as to open up the possibility that Westwood could sell the facility to another provider. Um, and I just wondered um, what, your, what, your, what, what officers' uh, views were in light of that uh, in relation to their, the soundness of Condition 2, if challenged, please, at a later date. Yep, so... Um Having, having discussed this with our, with our legal counsel here, um, we, we agree that there, there could be some flexibility in that to, to allow it to, to go out to other, other users within, um, within a C2 use, um, but there would still be management plan conditions, etc. that so we wouldn't lose the C2 use and it would still be managed um, as, as it would be if permission was granted today. Okay, so your your recommendation would be slightly changing, then, would it? Um, it the condition would just re remove the personal personal part of it to Westwood and, and it be to a pro other C two other C two use providers within that remit. And, and so, there, therefore, although we are also told by the applicant Westwood about their provisions. We shouldn't maybe give too much weight to that because it could be another operator that could be operating the facility. Um, well, yeah, but there is still the management plan condition, so we'd, we'd have to, to review that condition. So we'd still want it to be managed in the same way. That that's helpful. I've got another question, just changing the topic slightly. Um, in relation to policy T O two. Um, I believe it, it talks about setting. Um, could you tell me what you think? Um, uh, could, you, could you tell me what you think that is a reference to, like setting, holiday setting? And, and if this isn't a, a, if this isn't within the holiday setting, where we think would be, please. Yeah. So it. It, talk, it talks about a, a number of different things. Setting is one part of it. Um, so you, you may, it, the, the site is within a, a mixed use of residential and, and um, commercial properties. So, you, so although that stretch immediately where Three Palms is does have a holiday setting, the, the wider area is a mix. Um, but policy TO2 TO also talks about different aspects such as you know, change of use, um, where there's a regeneration benefit or there are, or there are other benefits. Um, so I take your point about the setting bit, but I think there's more to that policy than just that bit. Okay. Um, and, and then going on from that, um, the PNP 14 talks about function. Um, I was just wondering how, what, what our thoughts were on that, please. Yeah, so there's, there's three parts to, to PNP 14. So there's the um, not being a HMO, which the proposal isn't and would be conditioned to, to not be. Um, then you look at the value to the tourism offer provided um, and you weigh that up against um, the, the size of the facility. So it's a 15, 50, it was a 15 bedroom facility in a mixed residential and commercial area um, and weigh that up against provision in the wider area, such as the additional new 280 bedrooms at the park and lighthouse. Um, and then you, that balance comes to a, a, 
you come to a conclusion that, or I came to a conclusion that the loss of the 15 hotel rooms there is negligible compared to the wider offer in the area. Yeah. So just to explore that one a little bit more, because I think that was um, PNP 14B, where we've got within the, tour, within the core tourism investment area, um, it talks about um, no reasonable prospect of continuing for tourism purpose and the change proposed would not detract from the area's function. I, I was just wondering sort of if we can expand a little bit more still on that sort of because yeah. uh, did, did you take the view that it wouldn't? Is that the key, key, um, key well, driver on that? So, so I took the view that there was some conflict with that policy. Um, I took the view that it had been on the market for a year without anybody coming in, or it had been, or it had been off, hadn't been in use for a year without anybody coming in, as, as far as I'm aware, um, coming in and offering to buy it as a hotel or a, or an a, or a b and um, And I took the view that there was some conflict with that policy, but the, but the broader policy terms and, and the lack of five-year five housing land supply weighed in favour of the development overall. Thanks, Mr. Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Are you happy with your answers? Thank you. Any more questions for the officer? Thank you, Councillor Madison. Hello. I'd just like to investigate a little bit more uh, what you said about uh, the usage of uh, the property as a hotel. Um, how have you investigated how um, recently it's been used as a hotel? How have you demonstrated um, the change of demand in that respect? I went by the information in the design access statement, which said that it hasn't been in use as a B&B or a hotel for the past year. Thank you, Councillor Madison. Are you happy with that? Thank you, Councillor Fox. Thank you. Just a couple of points on this. Um, could the officers amplify what is meant by the right property and location. That's my first question. Second one, in relation to this consultation event, I, I wasn't even a councillor at the time, uh, didn't go along to it, so I've no idea how successful or not it was. Um, it would be helpful just to get some sort of feedback as to how sincere or otherwise that consultation was. And then thirdly, Westway talk about a, a similar property to this at Steepway and in terms of, of words like dangerous precedent I, I just wonder whether Steepway fits into that sort of fear or whether Steepway has been um, a good example which would um, help to reassure people I just wonder which way you go on that Yeah so in terms of um how uh, the speaker des described it as the right property in the right area. Um, I think it, it meets their criteria in terms of its size, and it's also in a very sustainable location. Uh, bus stops outside, um, close to the town centre, um, close to the train station, um, within walking distance to the beach. So it provides a, a good quality um, environment for people who are looking to recover and get back into normal life. Um, in terms of the um, the uh, consultation event, um, I think Westwood have summarised those points in their design and access statement, um, and um, I think they they provided some um, responses within the, the design and access statement as to, to to questions that were most answered, most asked, and um, in terms of steep way. Um, have spoken to Westwood about, West, Westwood about that, and um, they advised that there, there was, it generally um, operates without any issues. There was one issue, um, and that the uh, occupier was seen to have broken their lease, so they were removed from the property. So, if there are issues like that, then they they can be um, dealt with. Could I come back, Madam Chairman, just on the final answer you gave? Yes, no problem. Um, what time period are we talking about? Is this one issue over, say, a two or three-month period, or is it one issue over a year or five years or whatever? Since it was operating. 
which is I'm not sure uh, but it's it's uh, more than a more than it's you know a minimum of a year minimum Some, of a year yeah thank you thank you Madam Chair Thank you, Councillor Fox. Um, now, Councillor Cow, if you'd like to questions, please. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And it's really this issue about viability. Um, and I note on page 64, in reference to TO2, um, it's having limited significance in terms of its holiday setting views and facilities, point picked up by uh, Councillor Billings and Councillor Madison. Um, are you aware of the popularity of this hotel, on, as was mentioned by the speaker, booking.com, but also on areas like TripAdvisor, where it has a five-star rating, um, which would indicate, and a lot of the comments there were very much about its fantastic location, proximity to the sea, services, town centre, etc. Um, I haven't seen anything in any of the reports that demonstrate lack of viability. So apart from the uh, applicant's access statement, um, what additional evidence can we uh, look towards? Yes, yeah, so as, I, as I said previously, there, there is a bit of conflict there because there isn't a significant amount of um, evidence to suggest that it's not viable. Um, but it's, you know, balancing the whole application against the local plan policies and the, and the MPPF. Um, but the, the the thought, tr the trail of thought was that it's a 15-bed um, B&B, and there are an extra 280 hotel rooms recently provided in the wider area. So, you know, considering that, it would have to have be considered to have limited significance. Just picking up on the, um, the type of offer, um, and I think again the point was made about the. Um, different offer of a hotel like the Three Palms compared to the new fragrance groups. Um, was there any assessment done about that sort of market comparison? Do we know? Um, no, other than the, the, the two new hotels are provided a different offer. One's four star, one's a, one's a budget, so. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Councillor Joyce. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to know what kind of precedent would this be setting, though, within a tourism area, taking into consideration the neighbourhood plan moving forward? Uh, well, every application is considered on its own merits, so um, it wouldn't necessarily set a precedent. Um, any, other, any, for, any other application would need to still go through the same criteria and be tested in the same way. That answer your question, Councillor Joyce. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, Councillor Ruff. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on um, the uh, open market. Uh, was the uh, property put on the open market? Is it giving concern at all as a business? Um, as it stands with I the. I haven't uh, been provided with that information. No. So it's. So it's No, I'm terribly sorry. But we are, we are determining the application that's before us. Right, so it hasn't been on the open market, as you are aware? I don't have that information, so. No. The other question was, uh, in the uh, thing it says, slow to medium mental health needs. What exactly is that defined as? And is that a risk? I'm not sure we have a, a specialist here to be able to, to give that advice today, I'm afraid, in terms of what um, the level of risk is, but our, our own commissioning service support the principle of getting this type of accommodation, so they wouldn't be doing that if, uh, if they didn't believe it was appropriate to put residents of this nature in that area, so I, I can't answer the point about the, the level of mental health risk. Right, okay, and the other point was uh, there's other hotels that have opened up, you mentioned 280 rooms. Uh, now, I just want to put the point forward that the hotels that have opened there, the price differential is great compared to these, what I would say is a different clientele for these type of bed and breakfast or hotels. And there is a cost element that comes into that with families, say, who may be looking for something accommodation as such are not going to the uh, 
multi-chain options, mainly due to the factors there mentioned. And then the other point is, uh, there's going to be someone there from 8 till 8. Isn't there a risk uh, outside of those hours, even though there is a 24-7 uh, phone response to that? Yeah, so there would be a support service uh, on call 24-7. Um, so even though that's not on site, there'd still be um, service that you could... Would you know the response speed for that? No, I don't know. No, no. but um, the, the part, the, they are partners with the, the local, with the, um, with all the emergency services as well, um, and there's CCTV on, on site, and there's a management plan as well, and also the, the occupiers, as I said, have tenancy agreements, and if they break their tenancy agreement, they'll, they'll um, leave. They'll, they'll be asked to leave. But it is, it is a situation where they're trying to, trying to get back to a normal life, rather than looking at them as, uh, you know. As, prefer to look at it in that kind of way. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, it's on short-term lease, but that's been extended to assured leases. Would, wouldn't that state that the time frame of the residents will be longer than 18 to 24 months? And do most residents move on within that time, or under that Sorry, lease do they stay? These planning on? questions I can't really ask them. They're outside of my remit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Adam Billings, thank you. Thanks, Chair. This, this might be a question that goes beyond the capabilities you have out answering around this table, but could I just pick up on that? Um, my understanding from reading the papers was um, that the expected stay of residents was 12 to 18 months. Um, do we have any information about whether the comment that we heard from the Speaker in, for the application in relation to changing from assured short hold to assured tenancies impacts on that. I don't believe we we do, do we? Um, no, okay, that's fine, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any other questions, please, around the table, around from members? Thank you, Councillor Tolshard. Um, thank you, Chair, I'm, I'm just not quite clear as to whether I can refer to this because it is a it is um, an item sort of listed in, in actually in the report so can I ask a question about that at this point yeah yeah thank um, you. It's, uh, I mean I think we all appreciate don't we the, the need for for this sort of accommodation but it has to be balanced against the sort of suitability of that accommodation and the and the location of it and um, just having a quick look again, as you were speaking through the report, um, I'm slightly worried about the reference to how vulnerable the what, what is classed as the ground floor, but may also extend into sort of, quotes, basement accommodation and how um, suitable that is for um, accommodation, particularly um, for these sorts of uh, residents. So I don't know if that has been looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it has. So there's the site-specific flood risk assessment that was submitted for the application has um, some flood mitigation uh, points in it which uh, require to be implemented. And once they're implemented, um, the risk to future residents is considered to be acceptable, and that's been um, looked at by the Environment Agency and by the Council's drainage engineer. And we have gone back to them and asked is that still acceptable for people with low to low to medium uh, vulnerabilities? And they said that it is yes, because the, there's there's um, you know future occupants be trained and signposted as to what would happen in, in the case of a, an emergency, um, and they've signed up to the environment agency's flood warning system, so they'd be pre-warned if there was going to be weather of that uh, of a concern. If that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, Councillor Tolshard. Uh, Councillor Fox, and then Councillor Downcow. Thank you. Just a couple of questions on the, or one, one on the need. Um, how, how can I put this? How desperate is the need for this? I mean, is this just a kind of a putting something in a portfolio for use as, as and when? Or are we talking about a really serious need 
that we should be taking account of. So how serious is the need? Um, any help on that would be appreciated. And then are there alternative locations that are on the market now, which perhaps are further away from the, um, fr from the uh, holiday areas, which will be more appropriate? Through you, Chair, um, we'll come back to Councillor Fox's point about the, um, uh, the the desire and the need and how desperate it is. And I do I do know that they're trying to find the best form of accommodation for for people in this situation. So I, I know that they've been searching for other sites across across the bay, um, and I think uh, Lex can probably quote the um, the letter from the commissioning unit. On, on, the, um, on the point about availability of other premises, I know that's a point when we're talking about um, location of new facilities like major supermarkets and things and doing that sort of sequential test. But for something like this, um, we have to look at the, the application that's in front of us, what's, uh, what's there and whether or not it complies or doesn't with the policy, um, and then make that judgment. We haven't done an assessment of looking at all available other properties in the area, and for an applicant such as Westwood to have to do that and go and prove why one wasn't appropriate over another uh, wouldn't be reasonable. They've made the judgment that it fits here. Their own planning consultants have given that advice over its acceptability in terms of policy terms. And from a planning officer point of view, we've made that similar judgment that we believe that the need is such um, that we'd make um, that, uh, that balance um, with those policies in place to say that, yes, this is an appropriate alternative use in, in this location. But uh, Lex may have a bit more detail on, on what the um, adult services said. Yeah, so the um, Council's care commissioning team advised that they're looking to reduce the number of people with enduring mental health living in residential care when they have the ability to live in a recovery-orientated housing-based model of support and that the model of high-quality self-contained accommodation proposed will offer individuals with identified support needs greater choice and control. So it's a modal shift to try and um, provide better accommodation. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Cow. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and that actually raises a, a further comment, actually, because that statement um, talks about the principle of um, supported living, um, of the kind that's being offered. But my understanding is, is that because of the change of circumstances, uh, because of the use of a neighbouring hotel um, just up the road, um, adult social care in terms of our own adult social care department, um, whilst they are sympathetic to the application, they're not supportive particularly of this location, given those changes in circumstances from the previous application, I think just over 12 months ago, or whenever it was. Um, so can we be absolutely clear on the distinction between the quote from the commissioning body and our own adult social care department? I mean, I know I had a conversation with them on Friday, um, and they weren't even aware of this application, to be honest, which was quite surprising. So I just want some clarification, whether that's Alex or um, David. Thank you very much. Yeah. Through you, Chair. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm conscious about a conversation I've heard that you've had with, uh, with um, Joe Williams. Um, they, they are clearly aware of this application because we've had a number of conversations. I think Westwood themselves have had communication with that team, whether or not with Joe specifically, I'm not sure. Um, but from our point of view, the fact that an unauthorised use of a hotel not far away from, from this location for um, asylum seekers um, has occurred within that period, um, I, I don't believe this application should suffer as a result of um, that you still not being regularised or authorised um, and having an adverse effect on, on the provision of, of the desperately needed service that, that this council wishes to provide. And I, I'm, I can understand the point that um, maybe Joe has made to you, but I, I don't believe we would be um, going against an application just because of a, another use of a, of a hotel which never got planning permission. Um, because that is going to be a temporary arrangement and a temporary measure and, and not a, a permanent arrangement. And like with Abby Sands, that's coming to an end shortly and, and we, we're 
assuming um, Esplanade will too. So. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, does the, the clarification and my understanding and feedback from the conversations I had on Friday was that um, the adult social care department was keen for Westwood to actually expand upon their um, consultation and communication with residents. And my understanding is that there was only the one formal sort of um, event held at the rugby club, which has been referred to. Um, and the concerns that were raised on previous applications um, haven't been addressed in this current application. Is that a fair summation? Through you, Chair. Uh, Lex may wish to come in as well. I know that our two speakers, the first speaker overran a bit and possibly the second speaker didn't get to continue on with her piece, but I would imagine the second part of that presentation would have perhaps gone into a bit more detail about the way in which the site would be run, the, the management, the CCTV and the, the coverage of the way in which it was going to be operated, which might have given you as members a bit more reassurance about the, the operation of it. Um, but certainly as officers, we've been, we've been given that feedback that uh, through the consultation event and through other leaflet dropping and information sharing, they have tried to address a lot of those points that have been raised by, by residents and by business operators um, in order to, to be a good neighbour and to work well with, um, with those premises there. But um, th there will always be concerns, I recognise, from, uh, uh, from, from residents. But I think we believe they have gone um, a considerable way to address all those points that were part of the reason for refusal on the first application. Thank you. Does that address your concerns? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Billings, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to look back on the reasons for refusal for the previous application that we referred to. And we've talked about some of those reasons uh, in the questions so far. We've talked about policies TO2 and PNP14. We've talked about flooding. Um, uh, I just wondered if we can talk a little bit about the two other reasons, reasons three and four in the previous refusal, um, and in particular the space standards that the flats are meeting. Um, if I understand it, um, the third reason for refusal in the previously refused application was because of the living conditions in several of the um, uh, flats that were being created. And the fourth reason in the previous refusal was because officers were of the opinion the area where this hotel is located is currently defined as deprived, and by creating more accommodation that were below the stated space standards within a deprived location and removing a hotel which provided jobs uh, would, would, not, would not add to creating cohesive communities. I'm wondering if we can just expand on those, please, a little bit. Yeah, so that more clarity was provided with this application in terms of the use, the use class. So, is it where we look at policy DE3, we we consider residential units, uh, residential amenity under uh, C3 use. Um, this is a C2 use, where, which allows flexibility on the space standards because they have communal facilities as well. So, um, you, we'd be looking at 37 to 39 square meters a, a room. Normally, the overall hotel has um, circa 470 square meters, so it meets the state's space standards, which, when including the um, communal areas. Um, and in terms of mixed communities, um, again, with that clarity on the, the use class and the occupants and what the aspiration is of the, of the proposal, um, having discussed this further with the policy members, members of the policy team, um, they confirmed that you know, it's exactly the right kind of thing to, uh, to, to meet policy SS11 insofar as it does provide uh, a mixed community. So, so earlier we were exploring the fact that the aspiration of the provider was to give the residents assured tenancies, which suggests could be there for potentially a longer term. We know that they're going to be there for between 12 to 18 months as a minimum, because that's what we're told in the design, in the, in the information submitted. Um, but because there is some shared spaces, we're effectively allowing substandard 
unit sizes because there's that ability to use shared space. Is that effectively the thinking? It just means that there's, there's the space standards that we'd normally apply to, C, to um, C3 uses, there is flexibility on that, so it does allow for um, smaller accommodation provided that it's good quality. Um, and as the Care Commission Group have confirmed, that the, the level of quality provided for the use type is, is very good. And it's only the fact that this is managed by a provider that's meaning it's going from C3 to C2, is that correct? It's the, partly that and partly the, the fact that um, the, the use class is, um, falls within a C2 use rather than a, a, a C3 use, which is residential, so it's a care, care facility rather than a residential facility. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Any more questions from members? Okay, thank you, Councillor Vardy. Yeah, I just want to go back to the point of the uh, residents now. You probably don't have an answer, but what my vision is seeing is if this is granted and those residents are there, is there going to be a similar kind of ambience and environment created that we have at Leonard Stocks that could be detrimental to the businesses in the area? Now, it's only 300 metres from the beach, I believe, and I see the hotels there, and then in the middle, you will have this. And from experience, I've had people saying, this puts me off from going into that area. That is the reason I don't go there. And maybe the reviews these uh, hotels have had will drop with newer uh, clientele, uh, holiday makers coming in by seeing this. So that was why I asked what the uh, low to medium mental health risk was from the residents. So are they going to fit into that society, that environment, that ambience that is already there? Thank you. Do you want to turn your microphone off for a minute? Thank you. Um, so, so the yeah. So, what people are going there to try and return to a normal life. So, it wouldn't be any different to having any other. You know, that that area is broken up with residential and tourism accommodation down on both sides. So, it wouldn't be any different to to that. Thank you, Councillor. And once again, over to Councillor Billings. I apologise, Chair, for the questions. Um, I just want to return to that, to this C2, C3 use, uh, and maybe I'm not quite sure whether we need any legal input on this. Um, is it clear-cut that this is C2 use? Because I, I understand there's been court judgments on this, where this has been a source of contention, where you've got this sort of um, uh, extra care housing. Um, is, are we clear this is C2? I think this is one for the legal team. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, well, the application is for a C2 use and it provides care. And so the condition that we're proposing is that it is restricted to C2 use. So, yes, in the, in the fact, in, by virtue of the fact that care is provided, yeah. it would fall within C2 rather than C3. Because if I understand it correctly, if, if we considered this to be three, C3 use, we, we, it wouldn't be meeting our space standards. Uh, I, I, sorry, yeah. I think that's right that, from what Lex has yeah. said, which is yeah. that the allowance is made because of the sharing facilities and because of the special use. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Um, okay, one more from Councillor Fox, and then I think we'll go into debate, if that's okay with members. Thank you. Just to say, we have to look at its application in the terms that it's presented to us. Um, we can't start. Uh, Councillor Fox, is, there, is this a question? Because obviously debate is going to follow after. This. It was a statement, so I'll, I'll, I'll okay. Finish. Shall we save that for debate, which we are now going to go into? All right. Okay. Thank you. So I think we will go into debate now, and I will call back Councillor Fox. Thank you. Clearly a finely balanced judgment in my view. 
Um, and I think we've got to look at the need on the one hand, how genuine that need is, and the impact on the other hand, both particularly in terms of the tourism economy um, and in terms of the um, any kind of antisocial impacts. I think we've been, certainly, I think it was unfortunate that we didn't get the final part of the presentation from Westwood, because I think we would have got the answer to that second part. Um, in the absence of that, um, and in the knowledge that at the other uh, location, that they mentioned, um, at Steepway, I will give the benefit um, the, uh, to, 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 to Westwood on that. So those, those, those are the, the, the two basic aspects that I think the, we, as a, we as a planning committee have to consider. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Any more debate? Thank you, Councillor Fox. Yeah. I'm just finding it difficult to reconcile the two halves, the business aspect and the need that there is a need for helping these residents to move out of NHS care and into the local society and community. On the other hand, I feel that business can suffer because we do not know what the outcome will be with the residents being there. So it's very difficult to reconcile the two and the need for it is great from the NHS point of view and you know I'm at a loss as to why there are not any other buildings or places within Tor Bay that can be utilised and in the whole of Tor Bay, Westwood have found, found one unit available and I find that difficult to reconcile. I think they need to look harder to find a place. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cowell, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I have absolutely no doubt that there is an overwhelming demand for this kind of facility. Um, the, the crisis in mental health provision, not just in Torbay but nationally, is well known to everybody. And I have no doubt about the uh, pedigree of this particular operator. Um, but separating out that need, a social need, compared to a planning um, need, um, and taking it into consideration of both the local plan and the paint and neighbourhood plan. Um, the paint and neighbourhood plan is quite clear that this sits within a CTIA, a core tourist investment area, whereas the boundary of the local plan is slightly, slightly different. Um, but TO2 in the local plan is quite clear in terms of um, outside of the core tourism investment areas, that um, demonstrated viability is still um, a consideration. And it's on those two planning grounds, first and foremost, and I'm sure other colleagues may have a list of others, um, that I find it very difficult to be able to support this application because of the uh, um, contravention of the, those two core policies in the two relevant plan documents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Uh, Councillor Billings, if you'd like to uh, sum up, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to follow on from what the previous speakers have had um, said and, and contributed. Very clear we have a need for this facility. Um, my concerns relate to where, it's bit, bit where the proposed location for this facility is. Uh, and, and my concerns come from, from three different areas. Um, the previous refusal um, that was uh, on this site, one of the reasons was the concern that the, that, that the smaller type of unit would cause to the level of deprivation across that ward as a whole in the context of trying to make a viable tourism area. Uh, and and I, I, I thought that was a very strong, uh, strong point that what effectively point four in the previous refusal and I was, I was quite persuaded by the reasoning that was set out by officers there. Um, then if we talk about the, uh, the, 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 the local plan policy, um, policy TO2, um, yes it's outside of the core tourism investment area, um, but, 
but the, the, the language of the policy is clear in relation to the importance of setting. And to me, as you, as you come down Sands Road, you've got, you've got a series of guest houses just after the, the, the rugby ground where um, there are very clear, there's a very clear tourism setting there because of the, uh, the advertisement that's going on in the buildings and the way it presents and the fact they're guest houses. And, and so to me, I, I didn't think we, we got to the, to, to the levels where we were able to, to, to do the conversion to, to this type of use. Uh, for the perspective of local plan policy TO2. And then again with the neighbourhood plan. We asked communities to, to, to go out and produce neighbourhood plans and the neighbourhood plan came forward with, in Paynton, came forward with PNP 14. They, 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 as the later made plan, modified the boundary. Uh, they did, made a conscious decision to include this, um, th th this site within the boundary. And I, and I don't think we've met the tests so that we can uh, see this change of use under the neighbourhood plan, um, particularly um, part B of PNP 14, where we talked about no reasonable prospect uh, of, of, of it continuing in, in, in a holiday use. I don't think we've, we've had that information shown to us, and bearing in mind that's what the policy wording sets out, that's the sort of information I would have hoped we would have seen, and it's the sort of information we've been told clearly by officers we haven't seen. So, so my concerns stem in part from what the applicant consciously chose to not provide in the context of the policy requirements. Um, uh, and, and then that, that, that part B goes on in relation to talking about not detract from the area's function. Well, to me, we could have a semantic sort of discussion about the word function and setting, but. I think, I think what, what, what they were getting at with the word function and what I interpret it is they're talking about a range of accommodation types. And, uh, and, and this location is 300 metres back from the beach. As a holiday use, it would never be as high priced as one on the front line because it hasn't got quite as good views. But, but, but you need to cater as a resort for a range of customers. And so to me, it, its function was the way I interpret that is, is, it's, is it's to provide, say, a slightly lower grade holiday use than the frontline one when we've just seen these uh, fantastic developments because they've got views, but to, to allow people who, who maybe don't have the huge budgets to pay for that frontline to enjoy holidays in the area. And, and so to me, I, I, I had concerns because of those three different points. The, 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 the point about deprivation that the officers talked about in the fourth reason for refusal in the previous referred application, uh, the policy uh, uh, TO2 in the local plan and policy PNP14 in the neighbourhood plan. That, that was uh, some concerns I had, Chair. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Any other debate from members around the table, please? Thank you. Councillor Madison. I just wanted to endorse what Councillor Billings said and to say really that we have seen too often really uh, in our neighbourhood how sensitive business is to um, changes in the mood and atmosphere uh, of a place and I think we have to be very cautious. Thank you Councillor Madison. Councillor Tolshard. <coughs> Thank you Chair. Um, before the other speakers came in and uh, um, I think it's evident that you know, we're, we're facing a bit of a dilemma, really. And um, a, a lot of the questioning um, has been related to social care and social provision, really, and mental health provision. Um, and I was going to suggest that maybe we actually need more um, uh, advice and detail on that before, um, before we are able to take a decision. But... Um, it, you know, we are here to make a decision on, on planning, planning grounds uh, rather, I suppose, than um, the social provision, although there, there has to be a balance. Um, so I think probably the points made um, about the, all the, the various constraints under which we have to make a decision is that um, it's difficult, I think, currently to... Um, uh, a approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tolshard. Yeah. 
Um, I'll hand over to uh, Mr Edmondson, who uh, would like to say a few words on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And um, in response to Councillor Tolchard's uh, comments and also Councillor Cowell as well, um, I was made aware this morning about this conversation. I know we, we haven't got the person relevant here uh, to talk because she's away on, on holiday. But um, I, I did contact Adam Russell, who's the strategic partnership manager from the, from the adult social care team. Um, and the response was that, yeah, from a purely strategic perspective, we have a proven need, which we've talked about today in, in detail, for decent self-contained supported housing for people recovering from long-term mental illness. And, and he said that Westwood are an approved provider with all the necessary skills and experience, plus they have a, a long-standing facility nearby. Um, I think what they were concerned about um, is that the because of the level of opposition from local local businesses and residents, I think they're concerned about the, the way in which um, the scheme will be managed and the way in which that, that potential risk will be mitigated by, by the company. And what I was just going to suggest to the committee was that you know, we've got various planning conditions on there about uh, the management of the site. We've got a suggestion that maybe we, we need a legal agreement uh, that's specific to uh, tying up some of those controls and that further liaison with our uh, um, commissioning team about how those risks might be mitigated could be put within that legal agreement as opposed to um, the, the reference to a personal planning permission that stated Westwood specifically. Um, and that would give you as members more reassurance about the way in which this, the site was run. But that's only if you accept the principle of, uh, of this being the right site for, for that thing. But I just wanted to offer the fact that we believe we can put those other controls in, in, in um, association with our adult services teams. They clearly are desperate to find sites and it is pretty hard to find sites in the Bay. Um, but it could be that we need some bit more explicit information about how they would mitigate those risks of, of local businesses and residents being concerned about how some of the new residents there will, will fit into that area, as, as Councillor has said. So that, that's a, an offer. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Billings. I think, I think I'd just flag um, Mr Edmondson. I think that was a very valuable point you made, and I think that's relevant irrespective of the outcome of any debate or or, or resolution that we make here because what, what what we've got here is irrespective of whether this is approved or refused you've got a situation where the the applicant is pushing back on a personal condition and we don't have before us uh, effectively a, a, a detailed legal agreement that would show how the absence of a personal condition could be satisfactorily di discharged perhaps because I, I was particularly taken aback uh, t taken with the, the point that they may wish to, to sort of sell the facility later on. Totally understand that, stand, stand that as a commercial need, but equally, I don't think we've got yet in front of us any information to, to give that check and balance if the operator changes. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Any more debate around the table, please? Okay, thank you. Um, in that case, do I have a proposal? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate some assistance from officers in the finer drafting of this, but my, my concern is on four grounds. Um, and my proposal would be refusal on the following points. The first one is that the, um, the development is contrary to policy T02 of the local plan and whilst it's outside of a core tourism investment area, um, it is in an area that is part of the setting of the tourism area, uh, and so I consider it to be a breach of policy T02. Um, the second point would be in relation to neighbourhood plan policy PNP14, where uh, clearly it is within the core tourism investment area, um, I've seen no information to show that there's no reasonable prospect of it continuing tourism use, and um, and so therefore I consider uh, that it would uh, it would be breach of that policy, and equally the retention of the facility, uh, in my opinion, adds to the uh, it, it adds it gives a functional benefit to the area by providing a range of accommodation types. Um, my third reason relates to my concern about the sizes of the 
proposed accommodation, and whilst I understand that uh, they are as C2 use, might not need to meet the set space standards as C3, my concern is that as this is a deprived area for overall levels of deprivation, um, and acutely deprived for living environment, the, 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 the size of the units would, um, would, would, um, con would not contribute to closing the gap between the most and least disadvantaged neighbourhoods and would provide a concentration of, um, densely, uh, a, a, of dense living environments uh, within an area uh, already suffering from deprivation and therefore be contrary to policy SS11. And my fourth reason would relate to the fact that the um, applicant has um, rejected the proposed condition in relation to personal use, and we have no proposed legal agreement uh, in front of us whereby um, we could ex accept the, the premises to be run in the absence of a personal use condition that we could rely on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Billings. Um, do we want some help with wording on this one? Thank you. Well, Councillor Billings has done a very thorough job of, yeah. uh, of looking at those points. Um, I suppose um, the, the policy one, we might have combined into one reason for refusal, if, that, if that's the way. But I can see you making explicit points about the local plan policy and explicit points about the neighbourhood plan policy. So perhaps it's better to keep those two separate. The, the size point is similar to the previous um, re reason for refusal, and so that's a, that is a legitimate thing to, to include. Um, and the lack of a, a Section 106, which um, isn't, is a late matter because of the point about the, um, the planning condition and the way in which we would seek to control it through that, um, is a legitimate reason for refusal and, and can be uh, if it's if it's not in place, but we haven't given the applicant an opportunity to, to have signed up to such an agreement, but that would probably fall away before any appeal situation because they would come forward with an agreement. Um, and it's not my position to keep flogging a dead horse if I can see that you're going a certain way with, a, with an application, but um, what I would always urge caution with is not to throw the kitchen sink at things and, and add on lots of un, unrelated reasons for refusal, but you, you're not doing that. It's just that you as members are coming to a different balance um, than officers have in terms of, uh, of the need versus the, the potential harm or uh, risk to, to residents and local businesses. Um, but we will, we will have a number of these challenges. You had one at the last committee and, and there'll be other ones in the future, I'm sure, for, uh, for this type of accommodation, which is, which is so needed, but it's so difficult to, to find locations for. Um, just if I may, I'm, I'm assuming in my third reason my reference to SS11 is correct, given the C2, C3 point. Is that correct? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor Cowell, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, can I go back to Mr Moran? Do you have any more words to sum up, please? Uh, nothing more from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will now go to the vote. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. All those against. Thank you very much. This application is refused. Thank you. I think we'll actually take a few minutes break. Um, so um, shall we see you all back at, what, 5-2? Yeah, about 10 yep, about a 10 minutes break, so just around 5-2. Thank you.
and then I speak.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready to resume. If you'd like to take your seat, members, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now moving on to item eight, and this is to consider an application for Lincoln Keep, Lincoln Drive, Torquay, P stroke 2023 stroke 0081. The clerk has confirmed those who have registered to speak upon entry to the meeting. I will therefore ask Mr. Sean Davis to introduce the application, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a member update, just to let you know, two additional objections have been received. Uh, in the course of reviewing these, officers have noticed that the officer report incorrectly says that the site is not in an urban landscape protection area. The site is in the Ilsham Valley, Lincoln Slopes, Ulpa. This does not change the recommendation for approval. Uh, this is the, the site. Uh, this is Lincoln Keep. Uh, the neighbouring properties are, properties are the Spinney, uh, number, I think that says 26, and 28 Oxley Road, and Castle Tor, which is a Grade 2 listed building. Uh, the, the gardens to Lincoln Keep uh, are also listed. Uh, this is an aerial view. Uh, Lincoln Keep is, is here. Uh, Lincoln Drive down here. You can see the, the gardens are terraced. Uh, Castle Tor, 28 Oxley Road, 26 Oxley Road, and the Spinney. Uh, this shows the Ulpa uh, in the green dots and the green line. So this is the boundary of the Ulpa on this side of Ilsham Valley. It goes underneath the spinney and underneath Castle Tor and onwards in both directions. Uh, the red line here is the historic park and garden and the red dots denote the historic park and garden. Uh, this is a site of special scientific interest. Uh, there's no relevance to the site. And this is uh, a local uh, nature reserve um, with the, the teeth pointing uh, to show where it is. So again, no, no relevance to the site. Um, this application is unusual in that um, most of what is being applied for already has planning permission. Um, these three uh, elevations here are of the rear of the site, the northwest elevation. Uh, the top one shows the uh, rear of the site as it exists today. The middle one shows the, uh, what has planning approval already, uh, so that's with the door in the same place and three Juliet balconies to replace the existing window and uh, brick work there. And the uh, plan at the bottom shows what the applicant is now applying for, which is to remove the steps, turn the existing door into a window, and turn the middle of the approved Juliet balconies into a new door with new steps leading down to the garden. Um, this is uh, the existing southwest elevation, which is the side elevation facing across the garden. And this is the proposed southwest elevation. At second floor level, the only change is to uh, install a door here, basically, uh, which is shown on the proposed elevation in green. This is the proposed additional story uh, floor plans. Uh, the additional story has been approved on appeal under reference P 2022-0403. Um, so this is approved already. Um, the applicant um, wants to amend the additional story by adding doors here so that part of the um, second floor roof can be used as a terrace and a window here and a window here. Um, the approved additional story has a floor to ceiling height of 
2.145 metres, which is the floor to ceiling height of the back of the existing garage. Um, they had to make it that uh, dimension to comply with PD rules. Uh, the applicant now wants to raise the floor to ceiling height of the additional storey to 2.4 metres. Um, this will not affect the um, height of the roof. These are the elevations showing the uh, additional storey. So this is the, um, the uh, southeast front elevation of the approved additional storey. Uh, this is the northwest rear elevation of the approved additional storey. Uh, these three panels here are, are stone recessed panels, they're not windows. Um, the proposal um, is to change those stone panels into the window doors and window that we were looking at uh, a slide or two ago. Uh, no other changes are proposed to the additional story as it approved. These are the other two elevations. So this is the uh, northwest uh, rear of the site. So you can see one, two, three, four, five windows across there as approved. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the side of the additional story facing the garden of the spinney with no openings. Um, again, the proposal is has no changes for those elevations. You can just see the first of the windows in the southwest elevation here, uh, but there are no, no uh, changes for the uh, proposed for the front uh, or the side facing the spinning. Uh, this is a list of the um, key issues set out in the officer report and the policies that relate to them. Uh, some policies officers don't consider irrelevant and those are the ones in blue. The changes from the approved additional story are at second floor level to essentially to reposition uh, the door to the existing circular rose garden. In the side, southwest elevation, it's to insert a new door uh, to match uh, the existing doors in that elevation. Or the, uh, the additional story the proposal, where it differs from what has already been approved, is to raise the floor to ceiling height from 2.145 metres to 2.4 metres um, and introduce new openings in the southwest side. So, two windows with doors positioned in between to provide access to part of the second floor roof to be used as a roof terrace. Um, visual impact. So our starting point for assessment has been uh, what is already approved. Uh, we consider the proposed changes to be minor. Uh, senior officer comments provided for uh, the first PD application, which we did refuse on a, amenity grounds, um, are, are, are set out here. Um, and, and so the, the uh, proposed additional story was found to be acceptable. Um, the inspector, in dealing with both appeals for the um, PD application we refused and the PD application uh, that was non-determined and which the inspector um, upheld on appeal, um, uh, the, the, or, or here, the, the inspector also um, uh, notes that the additional story would respond to the host dwelling in terms of its scale, materials and design and would not therefore appear as an incongruous addition to the roof of the building, but rather as a well-considered extension. Um, heritage, again, starting point um, is what's been approved. Lincoln Keep is not in a conservation area. It's not a listed building. Um, Castle Tall Grade 2 is a Grade 2 listed building, and the gardens to Lincoln Keep and associated garden buildings are listed. Um, Again, senior officer comments provided for the first uh, PD application uh, found that the proposal was acceptable in heritage terms. Historic England have been involved with these proposals from the very beginning um, and um, are, are supportive of the uh, additional story. There have been design iterations to get to that point um, and the applicant has 
had to amend their initial proposals um, and subsequent proposals. Um, uh, Historic England has not um, commented on this current application. Um, Neighbour amenity, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we did initially refuse the first um, permitted development application on the basis that um, the proposed additional story would be overbearing, visually intrusive, and would overshadow the garden to the spinney. And we maintain that position in the appeal statement um, covering both PD applications. Um, the inspectors didn't agree with us and concluded that the proposal would not have a harmful impact on the amenity of the spinney. Um, officers don't consider that any other property would be affected by the additional story or the second floor um, proposals um, in terms of the, in terms of neighbour amenity to any significant degree. Uh, again, the uh, changes now proposed are considered to be minor, and, and officers don't consider they would affect any neighbouring property. Um, Castle Tall is approximately 15 metres distant from the site. Uh, the properties at Oxley Road, approximately 60 metres. Um, the proposed openings in the additional story um, in the southwest elevation would face away from neighbours. Um, this is the urban landscape protection area policy. Uh, it's, I'll read it out. It says development within urban landscape protection areas as shown on the policies map will only be permitted where uh, it does not undermine the value of the Ulpa as an open or landscape feature within the urban area and it makes a positive contribution to the urban environment and enhances the landscape character of the Ulpa. Um, in this case, officers note that Lincoln Keep uh, is, a, is a house that is already there, it exists. Um, Lincoln Keep is wholly within the Ulpa. Um, the Ulpa itself is uh, already urbanised to a fair degree. Um, uh, the additional story has already been approved. Um, Ulpas are not planning designations that bar further development. Uh, new housing is, is um, I, I've seen certainly, uh, new housing approved within Ulpas. Um, most houses along the southern section of Ilsham Road are, are within the Ulpa. Um, officers don't consider that the proposals would undermine the Ulpa and consider that the proposals would make a positive contribution to the urban environment for a good design. Officers do not consider that any impact on the landscape character of the Ulpa is significant enough to warrant refusal. Uh, this is the um, uh, more of the Ulpa, if you like. So the site is, is here. This is Lincoln Keep. Um, this is uh, Ilsham Road. Um, all of these houses are in the Ulpa. Uh, the, the green dots show where the Ulpa is in the solid green lines. Um, uh, as, as well as Lincoln Keep itself at a, a, a building uh, to the southwest. So it, it's already um, a fairly urbanised Ulpa. Um, when you walk along the Ulpa, you can see uh, lots of housing. Um, uh, you can see some of some of the properties up here, and the tops of them, as well as the top of Lincoln Keep itself. Uh, and you can see from some angles, you can see uh, some of the housing up, up here, just outside of the Alpa. To the north, you can see uh, long distances of flats, blocks of flats. Um, so officers don't consider that uh, the additional story to Lincoln Keep would undermine the character of the Alpa such that refusal was warranted. Um, officers recommend planning permission is granted subject to conditions contained within the committee report, uh, final drafting uh, and addressing any further material considerations that may come to light to be delegated to the Assistant Director for Planning Housing and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Davis. 
Um, I now call Ian Collinson to address the meeting against the application. Uh, Mr Collinson, you have five minutes and the clerk will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Um, there are four adjoining properties to Lincoln Keep, the Castle Tor, the Cairn, the Chine and the Spinney. We all object to this development proposal. I am authorised to speak on behalf of all four. Castle Tor is a Grade II listed building. Lincoln Keep resides within its curtilage. Castle Tor was built in 1930 by Horace Pickerskill, who created the magnificent garden that is protected today. Lincoln Keep was built in the bottom right-hand corner of that garden and was within its protected curtilage. UA UID 1393661 states Castle Tor is a Grade II listed building. UID 1000131 specifically states Lincoln Keep as a protected structure within RPG Grade II listing. Fact. References to PD obtained basis material emissions, false and misleading statements is at second response stage with the Ombudsman. It is a criminal offence to obtain planning permission on such a basis. The height limit by the inspector who accepted it, basis those false, false statements and omissions, on appeal was 2.2 metres. This is 2.4, not allowed. There are three significant failings with LPA DE1 design DE2, development amenity, and DE4, building heights. High Court decision, 3rd of February 2022, Bayes Noah against Harringay Council confirmed the impact assessment of overbearing, intrusion, privacy, and noise on neighboring properties is a priority. The Supreme Court decision on the 1st of February 2023, Fern against Tate Gallery, confirms visual intrusion is a nuisance. Already reviewed and confirmed in a written decision by Torbay Planning, David Edmondson letter, 10th of February 2022, it is overbearing and intrusive to the spinney. It also fails against LPA ER4 ground stability. That first story you saw is the smallest it's at the bottom of a steep slope on Lincoln Drive. It forms the garage. It supports the other three heavier stories. It is structurally weak. It is subject to sliding and flooding. This is an area of limestone rock with possible sinkholes. There's been no structural survey. It's on a tight, blind bend of Lincoln Drive. There's no development access. There's been no method assessment. It is extremely dangerous to even consider building the equivalent of two storeys on top. Planning law requires applications for planning permission must be determined in accordance with a development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. This proposal does not comply with 22 development plan policies. There are no material considerations. The National Policy Framework requires all proposals to deliver sustainable development, and this is assessed against three things. Economic role, contributing to building a strong, responsive, and competitive economy. This proposal does not provide any economic benefit to Torbay or local community. It is for the financial benefit of two individuals. Social role, supporting a strong, vibrant, and healthy community by providing the supply of housing. This proposal does not contribute any additional housing or contribute to a healthy, healthy and cohesive community. Remaining. Thank you. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Over 50 objections across the bay, including Wellswood Community Partnership and the Torbay Torquay Neighbourhood Forum. Environmental role, contributed to protecting and enhancing natural, built and historic environment. This proposal does not integrate with its surroundings. This is a residential district we do not have any five, six storey buildings. It does not protect or enhance the environment and harms the site's grade two listed status. Please respect and protect our local people, respect and comply with our planning laws and local planning policies, protect our local heritage, protect our local amenities, 
and put public interest, including health and safety, before individual financial benefit. Thank you. Please refuse 81. Thank you, Mr Collinson. I now call Dr Horder, Chair of the Torquay <laughs> Neighbourhood Plan Forum, to address the meeting against the application. You have five minutes and the clerk will let you know when you have just one minute remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This statement has been reviewed and approved by the steering group of the Torquay Neighbourhood Plan Forum. The Planning Officer's report makes reference to the Bricks and Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan and the Torquay Peninsula Neighbourhood Forum. I would just like to clarify that I represent the Torquay Neighbourhood Plan Forum and we developed and are guided by the Torquay Neighbourhood Plan adopted in 2019. The forum has noted objections from neighbours in the Wellswood Community Partnership and, with reference to our mantra of community-led planning, the forum does not support this application. For our consultee response, we completed our policy checklist to conduct an objective assessment of the application against the development plan policies. I have sent this checklist to you, showing non 22 non-compliances to assist with your deliberations. You will see from the officer report that the proposal to add an additional story and other modifications to this property has been the subject of various planning applications since 2021 under GPDR rules, all of which were refused by Torbay Council on the grounds of non-compliance with GPDR requirements and the significant impact on neighbouring properties, in particular overbearing, overlooking and consequent loss of privacy. Notwithstanding the approval via appeal of P2022-0403, for consistency, the justifications for refusal of this new application remain. The appeal inspector allowed appeal B for an internal story height of 2.145 metres, but he dismissed appeal A for 2.415 internal story height extension. Thus, the additional story can be built in line with Appeal B, and we acknowledge that fact. The current application is effectively a new application, which essentially is attempting to gain approval against Appeal A. In accordance with planning law, planning permission must be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. So it requires a full assessment against the development policies. There are no other material considerations. It does not support Torquay's housing needs, support the local economy, benefit the local community, or enhance local surroundings or environment. The changes to fenestration do not resolve the concerns related to privacy and overlooking. You should note the Supreme Court's judgment dated 1st February 2023 relating to the appeal against the Court of Appeal in Fern versus the Board of Trustees of the Tate Gallery. This judgment provides clarity on the importance of protecting against overlooking and loss of privacy. It is therefore relevant to this application due to the detrimental impact on its neighbours, i.e. policies DE1, DE3, DE4 and DE5. This application includes additional windows within the additional story, which exacerbates the unacceptable impact on neighbours compared with previously submitted applications. The forum does not agree with the planning officer's report and asks that you refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horder. I now call on Mr. Faraday of Base Planning, who is joining us via Zoom, to address the meeting in support of the application. You have five minutes, and the clerk will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Mr. Faraday. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Um, just in, quickly in response to the, uh, to the objection comments so far, um, I'd like to clarify that the building, the keep, is not statutory listed itself, um, and that with regard to material considerations, the status of the fallback position, which is what we've secured through prior approval, is, is a material consideration in this instance. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to state that. My name's Keegan. Um, I'm planning agent acting on behalf of Mr and Mrs Marks. Um, speaking in support of the proposal. Mr and Mrs Marks have continuously sought to engage the authority throughout the entire process, having discussions with officers through pre-application and implemented comments received. As a result of these conversations, the proposals have received full support from both the planning officer and Historic England. To reiterate, 
The site benefits from prior approval, which permits the addition of a new story atop Link and Keep, which would extend the site upward to the exact same height. The applicant fully intends to implement their consent and seeks a number of modest alterations through the householder application, which exceed the limitations of prior approval to improve the resulting quality of the development and functionality of their home. These additions include a south facing terrace, internally raising the ceiling height for the top floor lounge, which remains below the approved parapet, and alterations to the window arrangement with replacement steps into the rear garden. As councillors will have noted from their site visit today, the proposed roof terrace faces outward towards the coast, away from the private spaces of neighbours, removing any perception of overlooking or impact to their privacy. To further reassure neighbours, the applicant has indicated that a small area facing west would be retained for maintenance only and not to be used as a terrace, as requested by the planning officer. Regarding the proposed window arrangement, the front and rear windows would remain as already approved and implementable. Prior side windows and therefore household permission is now sought to provide south facing windows and doors to access the proposed terrace. As already set out, the addition of these openings would have no impact upon neighbouring community and would simply facilitate access to an acceptable terrace. To clarify, prior approval was allowed through appeal and councillors are invited to review the appeal decision. Through this decision, the planning inspectorate determined that the additional story resulted in no significant impact to amenity and was an appropriate design and materiality to ensure the visual quality of the keep. Therefore, given that the additional story is confirmed as acceptable and is implementable by virtue of an extant prior approval, the only matters relevant for this discussion are the addition of a terrace with south facing openings and replacement stairs to the garden, each element of which has been evidenced as appropriate, amounting to no harm and result in clear enhancements to the keep. It's also relevant that a large majority of objections received from residents relate to matters already confirmed as acceptable and approved, and therefore should be afforded significantly less weight. Regarding the most recent objection received, which queried whether the keep is locally listed and referenced its location within the local urban landscape protection area, we must stress that neither of these local designations would have had any implication on the consented prior approval, as they are not a matter of a consideration. Nonetheless, we agree with the officer and maintain that the proposal is entirely policy compliant. In addition to this current proposal, Mr and Mrs Marks have undertaken substantial amounts of work at Lincoln Keep, restoring the house and garden what was quickly becoming degraded through many years of neglect. Their efforts to date have vastly improved the visual quality of the keep and gardens, and these further enhancements will result in the keep becoming a high quality dwelling, as it was always intended, ensuring it's appropriately maintained. These efforts would have been apparent through your site visit this morning. I would like to now read a statement from the applicant. We are fully aware of the importance of both the house and gardens. We feel we are only the custodians of both the house and gardens until they are passed to the next generation of our family or new owners. We have rescued the gardens from total loss due to year, years of neglect and incorrect and incompetent repairs. The Port Collis alone cost £19,000 to repair. and We have spent over £100,000 on repairs to the walls and paving within the garden. We are asking for three minor alterations. One minute remaining. One, to see access to our stunning gardens from our house. Two balcony on top floor for two reasons to see the garden view to see the garden and sea view easy access to garden level in case of fire three to increase the internal ceiling height which does not affect the already approved exterior roof height all applications since 2021 have been involved it, it have been with the involvement and inclusion of the planning officer in historic england both of these parties support these changing changes as has been evidenced we therefore urge this committee to uphold the recommendation of the officer and approve the householder application, which provides sympathetic enhancements to an already approved development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Faraday. Uh, committee members, I will now invite questions to the planning officer. Please may I remind members, questions should only cover matters not raised in the presentation. Are there any members wishing to ask our officers a question, please? Thank you, Councillor Fox. Just as much of clarification, um, I've read somewhere that Historic England didn't comment, but I've also heard in presentations that Historic England support this. Can I have some clarification on that, where Historic England stand on this? Uh, yes. Um, Historic England have not commented on this application. Uh, they were consulted. They wrote back to us and say we're not going to comment, basically. Um, I've said in the presentation that they are supportive of the uh, additional story. Uh, the reason for that is um, at the, st 
the, the applicant first put in um, a single application to cover everything they wanted, which we said wasn't acceptable, uh, and they ended up reducing that in scale very, very significantly. We recommended to the applicant to engage in a pre-application process with us and with Historic England. They did that. Um, there was, I, I attended a meeting uh, on Zoom with Historic England to discuss various options for an additional story. Um, and and they, they gave positive comments about the one that has subsequently been approved. Um, the first permitted development um, application uh, that was made, um, Historic England were consulted on that. They had some design comments. Uh, initially, the additional story was to have like a, a turret feature on top of it, a small turret feature. They asked for that to be removed, and it was removed from the plans. Um, and they wrote to us um, saying um, that they were um, supportive of the application as it is amended and had no, uh, no further concerns. So they, a quote from their letter, this is from application P2021-1084. Um, Historic England has no objection to the application for the additional story on heritage grounds. Your authority should take these representations into account in determining the application. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Fox. Any other questions from members, please? Thank you, Councillor Cow. Yeah, just for clarification, um, we've got um, a permission in place for permitted development for the extra story, is that correct? Yes, it, yes, that's correct. Um, the applicant um, won on appeal okay. permission for the additional story, um, exactly the same external dimensions as the additional story shown in the current proposal. The only difference is the current proposal has a, a slightly higher internal floor to ceiling height. Um, and it has three new openings in the southwest side elevation, which are the door window on either side, to give access to part of the roof of the existing second floor is to be used as a terrace. So, through you, Madam Chair, what we're actually determining today is the proposal for the revised design and layout of the windows and steps and doors etc on that additional um, story um, and in so doing if that's granted that will then formalize the prior appeal approval of the permitted development i, I would no I, I don't think so um, the the prior approval um, is is planning permission so Planning permission exists today for the additional story. They can, the applicant can build it. They don't need to engage with us any, any more. So 6.14 litres only? Yes, that's correct. So Excuse me, sir, please do not call out the... Uh, excuse me, sir, please. Let the uh, planning committee and the officers come to the conclusions. Thank you. So just, just to clarify, the, the applicant can build the additional story to exactly the same dimensions externally um, as the additional story that's shown in the current proposal. The, the only thing is they would have to limit their, um, if this application is refused, they would have to limit the internal floor to ceiling height to 2.145 metres um, and they would not be able to put on the free openings in the southwest elevation, that being the doors, window on either side, that this current application has. But I'm a bit confused. Um, the, this issue about the internal height of 2.1 to 2.4, how are they going to achieve that 2.4 within a, with a within the, without raising the current height? Is it reducing a cavity or void? Or uh, I'm not a builder, so I, I can't tell you. Um, best I can do is to show you, uh, again, the uh, proposed section drawing so the one on the left is approved um, and it shows 2.145 meters the one on the right is proposed and i think it's the green um, that's uh, 
it shows 2.4 meters. It must be the green. So how they do, I, I don't. I'm afraid I don't know. There's a parapet. Darren. There's, there's a parapet wall around the edge. We saw this this morning when we were there that allows for that uh, capacity of 30 centimetres or just under 30 centimetres to be able to be incorporated. Uh, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't uh, be... The additional storey wouldn't involve any change to the exterior of the roof. The roof would stay where it has been approved. So it's just an internal change. And in terms of how they achieve that, all I can do, I'm afraid, is to show you the, the section drawing. Thank you, Councillor Cow. Uh, Councillor Billings, thank you. Can I, can I just explore that? Because this was this, one of the things that was, I was struggling to get my head around earlier, Councillor Cow. So if I understand it, Mr Davies, the, on, the, on the proposed drawing on the right-hand side, um, is it the green that is proposed? Uh, I believe it is. I'll just be a moment and I'll open the drawing up uh, to a larger scale so I can read the, what the writing says. I'm just thinking it was the green doors that were proposed in another drawing. So Yeah, the green doors are proposed. Yeah. I mean, this is just a section, just yeah. a section drawing. Um, but uh, I'm afraid my eyes aren't good enough to... To read that. Uh, okay. Probably. I've, I've got it here. Um, okay, it's the green, basically. So the, the green line um, is 2.4 metres of this proposal. That's what the writing says. If, if I understand it, if I may, and correct me if I'm wrong. So. The drawing on the left-hand side shows uh, the, the, the roof build-up, the, the sort of the horizontal bit of blue, and then on either side, so to create a shape that's broadly looking like an H, uh, we've got a parapet wall on the right and the left-hand side, so that for any neighbour or, 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 or onlooker looking at it, you would see the, the, the parapet wall, you wouldn't see the roof, unless you were looking yeah. down from above, which is unrealistic, you'd actually see the parapet wall, but that the height of the roof would be formed. Brilliant. If we can push that across the left-hand side, perhaps. Um, technical <laughs> IT... Oh, just leave it there, David's fine. It's technical IT skills. Perfect, that does enough. So there seems to be a, a line in the render going round the masonry that's common to both drawings. Yeah. And on the left-hand side... That line in the render seems to be higher, perfect, just there, seems to be higher than the outside part of the roof. And on the right-hand side, the line in the render seems to be closer to the outside height of the roof. Um, I, I don't think so, no. Um, the, the, just for clarity, the, the, the blue um, writing uh, yeah. the, and, and line says approved parapet height unchanged. So the... Yeah, so the parapet height is the same. Yep. We're talking about... So we've got... We've got our parapet walls there. And what we're talking about is this part of the flat roof inside. Now, if I understand it, the parapet walls have stayed the same yep. and we've yep. just moved these, these ceiling joists up slightly, yep. which is visually not going to change the view for anyone. But actually, the green appears to move up compared to the blue on the left-hand side. Is that correct, please? Uh, can you can you see the image on the slightly enlarged on the on the right-hand side? So the red the red shaded area is the line of the former yeah. parapet, uh, the ceiling height. But in order to get that additional ceiling height, it goes up to the green okay. shaded area. Um, and that gives the 2.4 um, internal... So, so we but have, nothing above the parapet. So level. we have changed the roof externally, uh, but visually, right. for those looking at it, there's no change. My, um, my, my understanding is that the roof just stays where it's approved and doesn't move. Um, that, that's, that's, but, but correct me if I'm wrong, that's not what that drawing shows. I 
that's, that's just the, the ceiling, isn't it? I can understand how visually looking at it from the side you will see no visual change. But actually the height of the roof has changed because behind the parapet it's gone up in height by 300 millimetres. Now if that's not correct, please can someone explain to me why that's not correct? <laughs> I don't know how else you could create 300 millimetres. It must be within that space between the... the previous height and the parapet so it must be within because that Because that drawing doesn't show the, the roof build up reducing in thickness. The, 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 the thickness of the red is the same as the thickness of the green. Give or take a few millimetres but Yeah I mean, that, I mean that's not Surely, the, the, surely that's the room. Madam Chair, I'm just trying to help this. I think if yes, it was, I'll permit that, Councillor Cow. If, if it was explained in as much as the depth of the parapet is now 30 centimetres lower, so the drawing on the right, the very top sec section is 30 centimetres depth less than the, the, the original drawing. So therefore, technically, the roof height has been raised, yeah. but within the com confines of the parapet itself. And, and the visual impact for those looking at it, it's Would stayed be the same. But technically, the roof height has been raised. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Cow, for that. My understanding was that the uh, the external dimensions uh, don't change at all, and it's just the internal dimensions. Um, that's. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't explain it to, uh, beyond beyond that. The only reason I labour this point is because clearly our reasoning needs to be robust and I believe for the purposes of things going forward that, the, that, that whilst the visual impact is the same, the external dimensions have changed on the part of the roof within the parapeted area, i.e. if you were to spot level it, it's gone up in height probably by 300 millimetres. Adam, uh, Councillor Billings, I, I think um, I know we walked around the site this morning. We looked up at the ceiling, and the roof and the ceiling was taken off, so you could see the uh, the, the roof joist. So that helped, but it does look as if the parapet height is only that top section there, and in which case, that that level um, at the bottom of there is not changing in either of those images. Um, that is still the same height. So that area was obviously filled or additional insulation and things on the original proposal, whereas now we're going to lose some of that insulation but gain uh, roof height within because um, it doesn't appear to change anything externally on the, um, beneath the parapet. happy with that explanation, Councillor Billings, or would you like a little further detail? I'm just aware, if it comes back as a point of fact, that the height of the roof build-up within the parapet has changed. That's a very relevant point. And therefore, my assumption was that the height of the roof build up, the external part of the roof within the parapeted area, 
I think it's gone up in height, and I wonder whether it's safer to assume it may have for the purposes of this application. What we ideally wanted, which we don't have, is a drawing with a spot level showing the external height. Because I'm looking at those drawings and I'm saying what I think is the position, but the drawings aren't very clear. I mean, uh, I, I can, if you give us a second, I can get the uh, approved um, um, drawing up and, yeah, and, and just measure. Um. I, I'm not, I'm just aware that this is a contentious application and this point might be considered. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll adjourn for uh, about five minutes so the officers can uh, gather all the information um, necessary. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for that uh, small interlude. Um, just needed clarification about the plans. Um, so, if I go back to members, uh, just to see if there are any more questions surrounding um, this information or new information that has come to light, um, please show your hands. Councillor Cowell, thank you. I, I, I think it'd be useful for um, an officer to clarify the uh, outcome of that adjournment for members of the public. Thank you. Over. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so just to confirm then, the external dimensions of the proposed additional story uh, don't change. Um, the additional 30 centimetres or so uh, headroom, floor to ceiling height, would be achieved by a, moving uh, a false ceiling upwards, basically. Um, the, uh, the approved floor to ceiling height has been artificially uh, kept at 2.145 metres so that it's no higher than the floor to ceiling height of the garage. Um, the applicant wants to um, raise the full ceiling that's shown on the plans to, um, to achieve that 2.145 metres um, so that you can now get 2.4 metres. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Fox. On a slightly separate point, um, in relation to the southwest elevation windows that we looked at on site and the impact on the nearest properties, my understanding was that the, the nearest windows were not to habitable rooms and they were, I think, 20 metres, but the habitable rooms were slightly further away. Is that, is that correct information or not? Uh, yes, uh, the, the windows you're talking about are, are already approved um, and they're in the northwest rear elevation. Um, so the first... The two on the right are, are stair windows, effectively, um, and then the, the three others are windows to the lounge. They're already approved. They're not affected by this application. Thank you. Thank you. How are you happy with that, Councillor Fox? Yeah, I, I just thought when we were on site this morning, that there was a, a new window in the southwest elevation, and we discussed the uh, distance from those windows yeah, to, to the nearest properties. And I just wanted to be clear in my mind what the distance was um, between the new windows and the nearest windows of surrounding properties. Okay, um, the, there is a new. Uh, new doors in the southwest elevation at second floor level here, um, and they would uh, be in the region of uh, 50 metres away from Castle Tor, 60 metres away from numbers 26 and 28 um, Oxley Road, and they would face away from the spinney. Um, so I'll show you on the the OS, the, the, the new window in the southwest west elevation that you're, it, it would be sort of like here, I think. So it's it's facing, it's facing away from, um, the uh, the, the spinney. So it'd be an oblique view going up towards the spinney. Uh, you, uh, I think you're, I think you're, mix, I think you're mixing up, the windows in the northwest elevation, which is here, right, right. and the door in the southwest elevation, which is here. So there are no new windows in the southwest elevation, is that what you're saying? There's a new door proposed. But no new windows? No new windows in the southwest elevation other than for the additional story itself. Okay. The, and, the, and, and your recommendation is that the, all the distances from all the windows are within what would be standard 
distances which are acceptable in broad amenity terms? Yes, yeah. So the, the windows that have al already been approved, mm. um, I looked at the distances to neighbouring properties um, and was satisfied that those distances were appropriate. Uh, and likewise, the, the windows that are now proposed, I'm satisfied that they're also appropriate. So we're talking 50 plus to 26, 28 Oxley Road. Yeah. But to the spinny, just to home in on the spinny, what would be the minimum distance there? Okay. So the windows face, the new openings face away from the spinny. Mm -hmm. So you, they, they face away from it. Away from it. Okay. So you, you wouldn't be able to look out of them and, and look at the spinny. But in terms to answer your question, um, sir, please, please, I have asked you once before, please don't call out. Uh, sir, I will have to ask the security to remove you if you can't stop calling out. Please respect the members and the officers. Thank you. I'm having to open up uniform so I can measure to scale. Okay. Uh, from memory, uh, the, uh, the windows I think you're talking about, which are the ones that are already approved in the northwest elevation, were a minimum of around 20 metres away from the spinney. Um, the, the new ones uh, that are now proposed will necessarily be more than 20 metres away. And facing different directions. Yeah, you wouldn't, you know, they don't face the spinney. Thank you, that's fine. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Uh, Councillor Billings. Um, Thank you, Mr. Davies and Mr. Edmondson, for your help um, with the query that we had earlier. Um, I just wanted to clarify, is there any reasoning in the appeal inspector's decision in relation to the refused and the allowed uh, schemes uh, that, that where, he, where he considers this parapet wall height? Um, or, or, or was, or, or was the, the, the visual impact on... Uh, the spinny in terms of openness, which is effectively being created by a parapet wall, was that not a, a, a matter that he goes into in his? Um, the, the inspector, the, the inspector's uh, logic for approving the second PD application yeah. was that the floor to ceiling height had now been reduced to match that of the garage, and. Um, on the basis that he didn't agree with us that the additional story, the whole thing, would be overbearing and visually intrusive to the occupants of the spinney and that it would cause overshadowing to the front garden of the spinney. The inspector didn't agree with us. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, the inspector's, is that what, does that answer your question? I, I think it does. So in other words, the parapet wall that's, that's, yeah. that's there um, the inspector effectively saw no difference in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the impact on the spinny from one application to all, all the other. What he effectively noted was a technical difference that one internal ceiling height didn't comply with his uh, checklist for uh, prior approval. The other one did, so therefore one was okay. Yes, that's, that's correct, yeah. Thank you, that's yeah. helpful. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Are there any other questions from members, please? Thank you very much. Well, in that case, um, I will uh, lead into debate, please. Who would like to uh, start the debate from members? Is there any debate? <laughs> Councillor Billings. Um, I think if I may, Chair, uh, I think we're in this, th this meeting because effectively an appeal inspector in a previous application 
disagreed with the local authority, if, if I may. Um, we, we seem to be discussing, and please officers correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, some, cha some, 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 some changes to an application which our authority didn't agree with in the first instance. So that previous, a previous application that gave rise to these parapet walls that are, that are, that are the same between the, the application of the prior approval that the appeal inspectors allowed, they're exactly the same height between that and what we've got here. Uh, and so whilst the, thi whilst the thickness of the roof build up, which I now understand to be the position, um, uh, has changed and it's got thinner effectively, the roof build up of the area within the parapet wall, that won't, my understanding, I can't see how, how that will affect neighbours looking at, at it, although personally, I can totally understand their frustration with the appeal in this decision. Um, I think that, that, that would be sort of certainly on the, 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 the height of the overall building, which I sort of, my, my, my feeling is that that's one of the key, key issues. I don't think anything we do today can change that. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, no, I think you're right. Um, the, 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 the plans we have in front of us show the height of the um, additional story being exactly the same as the height of the additional story that was approved on appeal. The issue, as far as heights go, if you like, is the internal floor to ceiling height. And I don't think having a ceiling sort of 30 centimetres, you know, uh, more above your head is, is going to affect anyone. And I don't think you would see it at all from the street. And I think, if I may just come back on that, this is possibly an unusual circumstance because this building, because it's been designed to look very much like a castle, has got a large parapet wall. Uh, typically, we wouldn't see such a large parapet wall that, 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 that covers the entire perimeter of a building. And so, therefore, a, a, a uh, a ceiling void thickness would be a lot more self-evident and when the internal ceiling height changed one might reasonably expect the exterior dimensions of the building to change. I think possibly in this instance because we've got this large parapet wall unusually that isn't happening perhaps. Yeah I'm not sure it's directly related to the parapet wall. Um, the, on the approved scheme that was approved at appeal um, the applicant has artificially made the ceiling low so that it's no, no higher than the garage. What they're now saying is, well, we'll just, we've got the space to raise the ceiling. So, I'm, I'm, you know, the parapet wall is part of the design to match in with the existing parapet wall around the second floor. That's why they've put it, in my understanding, why they've uh, put it on there. But I, th I think that point about the thickness of the roof build-up within the roof area, within the bit surrounded by the parapet. We, we would have looked at that perhaps more closely if it wasn't for the fact the building height was already set by a parapet wall in the first instance, perhaps. Um, I'm not, not uh, entirely sure, but certainly the external dimensions of the roof um, haven't changed in the current proposals. It's... Um Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Billings. Any more debate? Thank you, Councillor Fox. I agree with everything Councillor Billings has said on that. Um, the only other aspect that was concerning me was over impact on amenity or living conditions of nearby properties in terms of, of overlooking the intrusion. But from what I've heard from the officers this afternoon um, and from our site visit earlier on, I'm, I'm satisfied that uh, that, that is acceptable in planning terms. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Any more debate? Thank you, Councillor Topshard. I'd just like to say that we're, that awful phrase, we are where we are, um, we're considering basically what has been approved, what is already there. The only effect on the change in ceiling height is probably a reduction in... in um, Oh, what do you call it that you put in a roof? Insulation. Insulation, thank you. You know, I mean, and that is, one assumes, um, almost up to the occupants of the building. And, and we are here to 
um, look, just literally look at the proposed doors at, at the other end of the building, and, and, and you know, and that's that. Thank you, Councillor Torchard. Uh, Councillor Billings, thank you. I think, I think if I may, it's, it's one of these uh, difficult applications because what one wants to do is to, is to look at the totality of the drawing we're being presented and the, the totality of what's not currently there. But that's not what we're actually being asked to consider, is it? What we're actually being asked to consider, uh, unless I'm mistaken, is some, some relatively small changes to something that perhaps, if there wasn't an appeal decision already in the background, we, 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 might, we, might, we might have different views on, but there's an appeal decision in the background that's, that's been allowed, uh, and what, 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 what we've got in front of us, perhaps, are some relatively small changes to that, and looking at those small changes in isolation, although personally I, I, don't, I don't agree with the appeal inspector's decision, and I think as a local authority we made the right judgment previously, I think the, the, the changes that, that are happening to it, I, I'm not quite sure how if we refused those changes, we would stand at appeal, what would our reasons be? And that's, that's where I'm struggling with this. As much as I don't really want to be proposing approval, given the totality of the scheme uh, and, and the strong community feeling, I, I, I think, well, if we, if we refused it, how, how, what, would, what would our reasons for refusal be? And how would that stand up at appeal? And I, I struggle to think we'd, we'd be on robust ground if we, if we, if we weren't there. Yep, thank you, Councillor Brillings. Councillor Cow. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And like Councillor Billings, I think if we were looking at this for the first time as a planning committee, I think we would have been arriving at the same kind of decision that previous committee came to. And that would be for to reject the application. I'm not sure, and I'm not convinced that just because a, a planning inspector's view, because it is a planning inspector's view, um, should actually have an overbearing influence on our thinking today. If this was a new application coming forward, with its revisions of the windows, etc., it's the point of principle of that, what we would have determined as overbearing um, and in contravention of the various policies that have been highlighted during the debate and contributions from um, speakers this afternoon. I mean, on balance, my instinct is that we, we should actually reject it. Um, and would the planning inspector have approved the, this current drawing, had that been the one he was determining at appeal? No one will never know, because that wasn't the circumstances. Um, and, and like Councillor Billings, it's finding that, if you like, that killer um, policy within the neighbourhood plan or MPPF or um, local plan to actually give justification for that um, proposal to reject this planning application. Um, maybe some guidance would, would help us, um, assuming that I'm not in a minority of one anyway. So, um, um, but my, my, my gut instinct, and based on the original reasons for refusal, given that it is a new application in effect, um, is that it should be rejected. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Carl. Uh, sorry, back to Councillor Billings. I think through you, Chair, that if I if I take Councillor Carl's question, uh, is it a situation where something where it comes forward for prior approval might be allowed because it's within certain criteria, where if but for that permitted development right, it would be refused? And is that what's going on here? Um, not, not really. Um, prior approval does have specific rules, like the floor to ceiling height, and not having any openings inside elevations. But the the, print, the principal um, 
those are just things you have to comply with if you want approval. You just have to, you know, follow the rules. Um, where the, um, the LPA can make a, a, an assessment and judgment is on the visual um, appearance and on amenity, effects on neighbour amenity. And, and the criteria for doing that are the same policies in the local plan um, that apply to a householder application. So we're looking at the same things in the same way. And when we looked at the additional story, we found that the visual appearance was acceptable and we found that the neighbour impacts were unacceptable and, and that's why we um, refused the first one and structured our statement of case in the way that we did. The inspector has looked at that issue independently, doesn't agree with us. So um, I, I don't think it's quite, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't think, I don't think um, it's possible to argue that you can, uh, something is okay under um, prior approval, but can be unacceptable under a householder because the principal issues are the same visual appearance, neighbour amenity, and it's the same policies that you, you know, that apply to both. Uh, I, yeah, I'm going to put it over to, uh, for some legal advice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I think the first point is that the prior approval, as the planning officer said previously, is effectively the ground for planning permission. So they have planning permission for that development in the same way as any other planning permission. I think the position put by the agent is uh, correct, which is that grant of planning permission is a material consideration uh, and obviously an important one for the committee to take into account and that, as the agent has said, they could go ahead and build that, as the planning has said, without coming back to us at all. And therefore, I think the correct approach is as put by the planning officer in his report, which is to compare what they have got planning permission for with what is now proposed and what those differences are. Now, clearly, at some stage, there will come a point where it, uh, someone will say, well, you know, this is, this, this is too different and it's completely unacceptable. And that, that's a matter of judgment. But I think the planning officer has correctly approached this in his report by analysing the differences uh, between what they've got permission for and what they, they're now seeking approval for. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, helped with a bit of clarity there. Um, any more debate? Thank you very much. Um, in that case, then, do we have a proposal on the table? Thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> Both in together. Uh, Councillor Madison. Thank you. So you're proposing approval. Is uh, is that out, as outlined in the officer's report? Okay, thank you. Exactly. Sorry. Councillor Tolshard. Thank you. I'm happy to second that proposal as outlined in the officer's report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll go to the vote. So all in favour. Three, four, yeah. Yeah, all against. Yeah, and that, oh, you put your hand out. I'm so sorry. I did not see that. Did you see that? So, we, shall we do that last one again then, please? <laughs> okay, all against. Okay, well, obviously that's down to me for the casting vote, I believe. <laughs> Lucky me. Uh, so um, the application is refused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for attending uh, this planning committee this evening. Sorry, one moment. Through you, Chair, that proposal was for approval um, and it was lost. You okay. now need a, a proposal for refusal and the reasons yep. for that You're refusal. Right, for yes, thank you very much for that. Thank you for... Yep, so, um, one moment.
Okay, so do I have a proposal for refusal, please? Patrick, uh, Councillor Patrick Joyce, thank you. And I also need um, a reason for refusal, please. Again, I think it's in relation to what we discussed earlier in the sense that um, the void area um, was completely, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't established. And I do believe that the proposals for the planning were not clear. Thank you. Um, can I take that over to the uh, officers to see whether they are happy <coughs> with that? So Joyce, that, that's more of a sort of a clarity point about the, the drawings. It, we need to have something substantial about why the proposal with the openings or the fenestration changes are unacceptable in terms of either the visual impact or the overlooking or those sort of matters, rather than a procedural thing about whether or not the drawing was, um, was clear or not. So in relation to um, the distance between the neighbours, and sorry, I'm losing my voice, um, in relation to the neighbours and also in relation to the um, clarity of the, where the windows and the doors are, I, I believe that obviously they're, they're not suitable. Over to our officers. Are you, is that enough information or are you able to help? Me too. I'm just concerned, Madam Chairman, that we're getting into areas which um, I don't think we're defendable. I think we're defendable. just asking for the officers to come back as, as I, there are a few people before you, Councillor Fox. Thank you. I, I understand the feelings and I know how close the vote was and things, but, I, but we really have to be very careful in terms of coming up with a reason for refusal that's going to stand up in, a, in an appeal situation, because understandably the applicant will appeal this. Um, and they will be arguing in an appeal about the, the material differences between what's been approved and what they're now uh, showing. And they'll be saying that they, they don't believe there's any greater harm there. So we need to be quite explicit about um, the... I, I don't think you can lose the impact, Councillor Joyce, only because of the distances that are involved between the properties and the, and the overlooking aspect. But, um, but if you have an issue about the design or layout, then that, you know... That's a different factor, but uh, I can't lay it on a plate. Uh, did you want to withdraw, or, um, or are you able to embellish a little bit more as to your reason for refusal? Thank you, Chair. I, I, I would like to just put it on record. I think in relation to what we've discussed in relation to the, the neighbours, the distance from the neighbours, looking at the designs as well and looking at the impact. Um, I get what um, the officer has said in relation to that we need something more substantial to use as an objection, but I think th um, they do class themselves as objections in my opinion, unless anyone else would like to come up with uh, an alternative. But for me, the objections are about the locality to where these plans are to the neighbours, about the plans with the voids. Okay, thank you. Um, is, is there an alternative? Um, in the room, which I think I'm, I can ask. Yeah, Councillor Cowell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I mean, I, I sympathise with the um, proposal um, from Councillor Joyce, um, and I think maybe if we were actually to reference specific local plan policies, such as DE1, 3, 4, and 5, um, and then I think that would probably give the reasons and substantive reasons for our um, decision if, if it's approved and it's, it's not a split vote again and goes the other way um, that, uh, that would give us grounds Okay, thank you Councillor Cowell for that clarification uh, Councillor Joyce would you be happy to um, accept that as a refusal as pointed out by Councillor Cowell I would chair so you're happy to withdraw your first and accept Councillor Cowles? I will indeed. All right, thank you very much. Do we have a seconder? 
Chairman, I, I plead with Councillor Cowell <laughs> just to drop, just to drop um, uh, DE4 because that talks about building heights and we're, we're, we're seeking to refuse something that's no higher than what's already got an approval for. So that wouldn't be, that would be a, sh a straight to the costs point. So. D what? Okay, as, as a clarification, what's the policy we're, re we're, we're using and what's the reason in relation to that? Um, Councillor Cowell, second. Yeah, so D one is around design and development uh, in terms of failing to relate to the integrate with local surrounding with respect to height, scale and mass. Um, significant impact on local and distant views is as per the checklist that was D three was development amenity, unacceptable overlooking and loss of privacy at neighbouring properties. I don't know why I said DE4, that was um, a mistake. Um, DE5, domestic extensions, extra story will dominate neighbouring and local surroundings and long distance views. Thank you, Councillor Cowell. Could I, Councillor Billings. Could I have a clarification through you, Chair? Um, officers, the, are those the policies that were used previously successfully in the previous refusal? Uh, DE3 um, only, uh, and so that was the um, impact on the occupants of the spinney, the neighbour neighbour impact on the occupants of the spinney. Uh, and um, D DE5, sorry, because that also covers, DE5 also relates to, I think, I think it was both of those, Not, it wasn't DE1. Thank you very much. So going back to uh, Councillor Cow, Councillor Cow's recommend, recommendation, and then uh, Councillor Joyce was happy to accept that. Um, just going back to the officers, are we clear on what is being proposed? I think we are. What we will do is preface it by saying that, as as members of this committee, you are unhappy about the fallback position because that was an inspector's decision, but you're unhappy with that outcome, and you are looking at that. You have taken that into account, but, um, but you've come to a different conclusion about the, um, the acceptability of this revised version on that previous approval, and then quote the various policies that Councillor Cowell has, has referred to. So. Thank you very much. So we had um, a proposer. Don't believe we had a seconder. Um, is there a seconder, please? Councillor Cow, thank you. <laughs> okay, and so will any debate on, on that? Although I think we've, we're all debated out. Councillor Billings? Could officers just talk us through um, potential cost consequences on this? I mean, is this, is this within a reasonable range of opinion? Or are we making points that realistically could be perceived as being unreasonable? I'm hoping that the proposer, who will be asked to potentially attend and make um, representations at the planning appeal, uh, will be able to say that he has been to the site uh, outside of the site meeting this morning, because obviously uh, Councillor Joyce was unable to be there, um, and so we'll have seen it in detail previously, and that's, that's okay. Um, but this is a judgment about whether or not you feel the alterations and uh, additional fenestration changes are acceptable compared to what was previously approved and that's ultimately what you're you're refusing this on um, although it sounds a bit like it's still about the principle of, of putting that floor in there but we've got to accept that because of the previous um, previous appeal um, it's difficult to judge about costs I, I mean there may be there may be an element of unreasonableness because it's it's small small elements of change um, that don't actually adversely affect those residential amenities. So I am I'm concerned about that. I think I think where I struggle most is whilst they are small potentially whilst they could be perceived as being small inconsequential matters of change, in aggregate they add up to more than the previously refused scheme. There's a cumulative effect of those changes, so you could use that word within the reason for refusal if you wish. Through you, Chair, would, would Councillor Cowell be prepared to include that word in his reasons? 
Councillor Joyce, sorry. Okay, thank you. I think we need to be really clear on the reason for um, the refusal. So, um, because obviously, you know, it has to be completely clarified. Um, so, back to Patrick Joyce, I'm sorry, but we do need some <laughs> clarification on the policies. Thank you. So, as set out before by Councillor Cowell and Councillor Billings, um, obviously we were re retrospectively looking at D1, D3 and D5. And on those points, um, would you, I'd, I'd like to submit those as my objections. Okay, thank you. Over to the officers, just to uh, make sure they are happy with that or whether they can aid with some wording would be most helpful. Thank you. I won't use the expression happy, Chair, but, um, but we'll obviously uh, um, go with that. And we will talk about the, the cumulative impact of those changes to fenestration to openings and therefore the adverse effect on the appearance of the, the building under policy D1, 3 and 5 of the local plan, um, making an unacceptable proposal. And we will preface it by referring to the previous um, inspector's decision. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we've obviously you're still happy to second Councillor Cowell. We've got a proposer. Just make sure that the clerk is happy with all the wording and the clarification. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If I can, it's obviously really important that we get this wording right. So re refusal and the reason for refusal is the cumulative impact of changes and therefore the adverse effect of the building under D1, 3 and 5 of the local plan with reference to the previous inspector's decisions. Is that, is, is everybody happy with that wording, officers and members? Okay. No, not happy, but... okay, thank you very much. So um, shall we go to the vote? <laughs> okay, um, all in favour, please. Thank you. And against? Yeah. And abstention. I think I'm going to have to do that one. Okay. Yeah. Four. Yeah, can we just actually do that again, please? Um, so, all in favour? And against? Yeah, and abstentions?
Okay, we're to just going to make this absolutely clear because um, we, we need to clarify this for the records. So um, we're actually voting for the refusal. Okay, so all who are voting for the refusal, please, if you raise your hands. So that's two. And against, one, two, three, four. And abstention was one. Yeah. Okay, so that is right. Okay, so that, uh, that motion was refused. <laughs> so um, we need, um, yeah, we need another proposal, please, on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Madison. Proposal to approve <laughs> according to the officer's uh, recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a seconder? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's all right. Councillor Tolshard. Thank you. Second. As, as before, I'm happy to second as per officer approval report. as prior. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favour? <laughs> in favour, one, two, three, four. Four. Yeah, so four. And against? Two. Who's against? No, I was going to manage that. I was going to have that. Yeah, okay. Against, sorry. Against. Two. Against, once again, please. Two. Two, yeah. Yeah. And abstain. And two. So they add the figures. Yep, so that motion is carried. Thank you. Well, that was very long-winded, but thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you all for attending the planning committee. This meeting is now closed. I look forward to seeing you all at the next meeting and wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you.